Welcome to Gridiron Greats. I'm Steve Walsh. 1981 represented the third year of the Howard Schnellenberger era at Miami, as well as the midpoint of a five-year mission to win the national championship, which Coach himself vowed to do when he was hired. With two years of recruiting an established quarterback in Jim Kelly, Coach Schnellenberger's team was poised to challenge the number one ranked Penn State Nittley Lions and their 6-0 record. Penn State, of course, was led by Joe Paterno, as well as young, talented quarterback Todd Blackledge and running back Kurt Warner. And we're fortunate again to be invited here to Boca Raton on the campus of Florida Atlantic by Coach Schnellenberger. And he not only invited myself to watch the game, but as well as two former players. We have All-American Fred Marion and center Don Bailey. So, Coach, going into this ball game, what were your thoughts? You, you really felt like you had a great chance to upset Penn State? Well, I certainly thought we, uh, if we played as well as we could and uh, we could get an interception or two or if we could, uh, that heat would prevail uh, on them, that maybe we would have be in a chance, be in a position to win in the fourth quarter, and that's obviously what we always ask. Boy, Fred, it's good to see you and Don. It's been coach. a long time. Yes, it has, Coach. Now, now, Fred, how about you defensively? I mean, they had a, a very good running back. Kurt Warner went on to the NFL and had a, a very good career. Todd Blackledge, of course, was part of that great draft class with Jim Kelly and Dan Marino. What did you feel like your chances were? Well, I felt like we had a great chance. Uh, we had a very aggressive defense. We were fast, and uh, we always got up to the challenge. Uh, playing against the top teams, uh, we always rose to the occasion, and uh, we felt like our outcome would be very successful against them. Great. And, and Don, this was going to be your third start, first time back in the Orange Bowl, though, uh, against Penn State. How did you guys feel your chances were on the offensive side well, of the ball? I have to tell you, Steve, I, I thought we needed to win. If we weren't going to win, I was afraid Coach was going to kill us because we had <laughs> lost two football games already that year. We lost to Texas. We were robbed on the road. And we lost to Mississippi State. And the week prior to the Penn State game, we played East Carolina, and Coach decided it would be a good idea to be in pads the whole week, all the way up to East Carolina. So we knew that we had to go win, and then he came in and surprised us. For the first time in his, his run as Miami's head coach, we didn't go into pads the week before Penn State. He, he, he let us recover after beating us into submission the week before, and we recovered. We were fit. We were ready to go, and nobody wanted to lose again. Trust me. <laughs> well, we're going to get into some of these mind games that Coach Schnellenberger play, uh, you know, played with you all, and, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun here watching this game. So you know, without delay, let's get to the kickoff of this gridiron great 1981 number one Penn State versus number 19 Miami. It's homecoming. It's Halloween night. What more can we ask for? So let's get to the kickoff with announcers Ron Harrison and Jim Gallagher. For the Hurricanes starting this afternoon at quarterback, it will be Jim Kelly. Kelly having a fine year as the QB of a Miami squad, which has gone four and two, going up against the very tough Penn State defense this afternoon. Nittany Lions with a record of six and zero. Oh. Larry Brodsky in at one wide receiver on the wing. Kelly rolling on play action, and he is hit behind the line of scrimmage and brought down. Bring him down, Walker Lee Ashley, the big junior defensive end, number 37 for the Nittany Lions of Penn State. So Kelly is brought down right at the 20 yard line, the line of scrimmage, and that brings up second down 10 as we get underway with college football from the Orange Bowl. The orange clad Miami Hurricanes and the blue and white Nittany Lions. Well, the Canes, if they want to get their offense rolling against this very tough Penn State defensive team, have got to give Kelly time to throw the ball. That time he rolled out, had good uh, lots of time, but everybody was covered. Slot offense with a split backfield. The give off goes to the running back, Smokey Roan, and he is drilled and brought down right behind the line of scrimmage by Leo Wisniewski, number 69. Great play by Wisniewski, the big defensive tackle, and it looked like he was <laughs> just about back in the huddle. He came blasting through. This team is big, they are solid, and they have got the best team speed that Joe Paterno has had in a number of years. Third and 15 for the Canes. We're just underway, no score in the football game. Again, Miami with a slot offense and a split backfield. Kelly drops throws and it is incomplete. Ron, I think he just threw that one because he felt that his deep man who was his prime receiver was covered and Bradley 
Number 86, the linebacker, was really putting the pressure on. Well, you can look for Bradley to come from one, the one side or Parlavecchio from the other, and they're going to put a lot of pressure on. And the Canes, offensively, were under tremendous pressure as the Penn State defense playing very, very penetrating style of football on the first series of possession for the Canes. Greg LaBelle, a junior from Danielson, Connecticut, will kick for the Hurricanes. He's standing on the one. The line of scrimmage, the 15, it's fourth and 15. LaBelle boots it away. It's wobbly, and it's going to be a little short. Takes a Miami roll across the midfield stripe to the Penn State 49-yard line. So the Nittany Lions take over with excellent field position. That was a 36-yard punt for LaBelle, and, of course, LaBelle punting into the face of a very stiff wind here at the Orange Bowl. The wind is going to be a factor today. It is really blowing, gusting up to 25 knots here, and that's definitely going to be a factor in the kicking game and also in the passing game. Todd Blackledge brings his team out of the huddle at the top of their eye. Number 25, Kurt Warner, number three rusher in the nation. The give goes to Warner off the right side, and he rips across for a good gain into the Miami territory to the 45-yard line. And uh, bringing him down for the Canes, David Jefferson, the rover back. Well, there you see what Penn State does so well. They give the ball to the deep back quite a ways back behind the line of scrimmage. They are so fast that as they're coming up, barreling up there, they have a time to, to read it, see where the hole is going to be, and then explode through it. And uh, Kurt Warner has really got blazing speed. Coming off a hamstring injury a couple of weeks ago, he sat last week out. Second and three for the Nittany Lions at the 45 of Miami. Blackledge to throw. Throws long. And it is incomplete. It was intended for Greg Garrity, who was deep number 19 for Penn State. Well, they'll throw only about 25% of the time, and there they tried to burn the University of Miami, and the wind was a factor there. When Blackledge let the ball go, it just sailed and uh, went far over the head of his receiver. So uh, the wind is, as I said, it's going to be a factor. Garrity was out there, had uh, good position on the defensive backs, but overthrown, and only because of the strong wind. Third and three for the Nittany Lions of Penn State. They're in Miami territory. The ball spotted down at the 45-yard line. High formation once again with a slot to the left side. Blacklitz pitches to Warner. Warner trying to turn the corner here on the near side and does a field and gets the first bat down out of bounds at the 40. Run out there by Freddie Marion, number 31. Just repeat there. Now we're taking a look at, uh, at their lineup right now. Kurt Warner, the tailback from Wyoming, West Virginia. And Kenny Jackson, their flanker, sophomore from South River, New Jersey. Greg Garrity, the split end from Bradford Woods, PA. Ball at the 40-yard line, first and 10 for the Nittany Lions. They're in Miami territory. Miami with four down linemen, four linebackers, utilizing the 4-4 defense. Man in motion now to the far side, still with the eye formation, and the give goes to Meade, fullback straight up the middle, and he is stacked up by the middle of the Miami defensive unit. Tony Ciccolo, the nose tackle, gets credit for the stop. Bill Kuntz, the left tackle for Penn State. Mike Munchak at the left guard from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Jim Romano is the center from Glenhead, New York. Sean Farrell, the right guard, West Hampton Beach, New York. And Dave Loeb, uh, the right tackle from Fairlawn, New Jersey. Mike to Cab, the tight end from Wayne, New Jersey. High formation again for the Nittany Lions with receivers left and right now. Ball spotted down on the 37, second and seven, and Blackledge, number 14 to throw. Throws out in the flat, and he's got his man complete to number 85, Cab, and he has run out of bounds on the far side by David Jefferson from the University of Miami, the 6'2", 220-pound senior. Miami defensively looks like this. West, Williams, Chicolo, Nelson, and Flanagan across. Lippett, Boone, Jefferson, and Marion are the deep men, and Brown and Nicholas would be the linebackers. Third and four, and the ball is spotted down on the 34-yard line for Penn State. High formation again. One receiver split to the left side. Blackledge operating a quarterback. He pitches. The pitch goes to Warner, and he is stacked up behind the line of scrimmage. Bringing him down at the 35-yard line was David Jefferson. Talk to him, talk to him. So it'll be fourth down and five, and Penn State is going to go for the field goal, and Brian Franco will attempt the field goal. It will come from the 42-yard line, so it'll be a 52-yard attempt. Well, he's got the wind at his back, and that's going to help him. Strong wind blowing here at the Orange Bowl. It's been gusting all day. Here we go. It's on the way, and it is going to be short and off to the right side. No good. 
So the University of Miami takes over. First down for the Canes at the 34-yard line in their own territory. The University of Miami Hurricanes now waiting to get their second possession of the football game, unable to do much the first time. And as we, again, have mentioned, the key is to, to give Kelly some protection and also to uh, try to open up some holes against this big, massive, and very quick Penn State defensive line. And, of course, Dave Stewart, the left tackle, offensive left tackle, went down with a knee injury. He is out for the season. His career ended, and they've got Welch in there. Speedy Neal gets the handoff inside and fumbles as he goes to the 36-yard line. But they have blown the ball dead, so Miami will retain position. It was Robert Speedy Neal being hit by number 41, Steve Sefter, for the Penn State Nittany Lions. You're looking at Chris Hobbs, the starting fullback for Miami. Smokey Rowan, the running back, a senior from Miami, Florida. The flanker, Larry Brodsky, a senior from Hialeah. And Mike Rodriguez, the split end, he's a senior from Tallahassee. A quarterback from East Brady, Pennsylvania, junior Jim Kelly. Second and eight, and Kelly drops the throw. And he throws, intended for Belk here on the near side. And Belk is belted right there by uh, Penn State's number 49, Roger Jackson. Here you're looking at Miami's offensive line, Barbarino, Bailey at the center, a junior from Miami, Florida. Mike Moore, the right guard from Bradenton, Florida. He is his sophomore. Frank Frazier, the right tackle, a senior from Tampa, number 79. And the tight end, Glenn Dennison from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. He is his sophomore. Miami splits receivers left and right. Brodsky would be to the top of your screen. A split backfield behind Kelly, who drops the throw on third and eight. Looks and throws, and he's got Rodriguez here on the near side. First time Rodriguez. all day. First time today in the early going that Kelly has had time to throw the football, and we'll take another look at it. Good protection here. He stands back there. He's got about, I counted, four seconds to throw the ball. And, of course, uh, there's Rodriguez wide open. Good catch right on the sidelines. Keeps the one foot in. Well, he's well in bounds. Good catch. Good pickup. First down. Hurricanes now on the 46-yard line of Penn State. High formation. The up back would be Speedy Neal. The pitch goes to Smokey Roan, and he stumbles as he comes to the near side and is brought down right at the line of scrimmage. Maybe picked up a yard to the 45-yard line. And so coming back, it'll be second down and call it nine. Rich D'Amico, Leo Wisniewski, Dave Ofer are starting for Penn State. Their linebackers in back, Scepter, Fritz, Bradley, Lankford, Jackson, Robinson, and Hamilton. Defensively for the Nittany Lions. Ball on the near side, hash mark. The wide side would be to the left or top of your screen. You're looking at junior Jim Kelly from East Brady, PA. 6'3", 215, dropping to pass on second and nine. Dumps a quick one out to Chris Hobbs. Hobbs is across the 40, inside the 35, and out of the 33-yard line. Chris Hobbs, a senior fullback from Tallahassee, Florida, 5'10 and 190, brought down by the free safety Mark Robinson, number 32 for Penn State. Early score there in the fourth quarter. Wake Forest. Clemson. Look at that. Look at that. And what a final. And huh. Georgia rolling over Temple, 49 to 3. Ball at the 33, first and 10 for the Hurricanes of Miami. A split backfield behind Jim Kelly. Kelly gives off now to Hobbs, and Hobbs tries it on the right side and gets finds out it's very, very tough there as Walker Lee, actually the big defensive end from Jersey City, New Jersey, at six feet and 232, meets him. Second and nine coming back for the Canes of Miami at the 32. The ball's still spotted on the near side hash mark, so they've got that wide side way to the left. Notre Dame, big lead over Navy. 38 zip in the fourth quarter. Slot offense, and Kelly drops the throw. He's got Dennison inside the 20, and Dennison's inside the 15 to the 13-yard line. A tight end from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, so two gentlemen from the Quaker State combine on Penn State. Let's take another look at it. Kelly threw into a crowd. Fritz and Robinson were right there. Now watch it. He drills it. It's a perfect throw. Two defenders right there. But just a great pass by Kelly to Glenn Dennison and a great catch. And another first down for the University of Miami as they're on their first sustained drive. Mark Robinson came up and made the stop. The Canes first and 10 at the 14-yard line. They're in Penn State territory. And they go with the I formation. Receivers left and right, and now Brodsky comes in motion. The pitch goes to Smokey Roan, cuts inside, and is stacked up at the 11-yard line. Flag on the play. 
We'll wait on the call. Nine minutes, eight seconds to play first quarter. No score in the Orange Bowl. Miami driving on Penn State. Steve Sefter made the hit for Penn State. The call is against Miami, and it's for holding, and it's going to cost them 15 yards. And here is Joe Paterno looking worried along the sidelines. Well, a holding call against the University of Miami. They've had several of those this year, and a couple of them have cost them actually a couple of victories in Texas. Their first touchdown against the Longhorns was called back because of holding, and then at Mississippi State, with six Southeastern Conference officials, holding was holding a problem again, and uh, that's the call, so they get set back, and that's a big setback for them, although uh, they're still down there pretty close, but <laughs> 15 yards is still 15 yards. First and 18 on the 22 yard line of Penn State for Miami. Here's Kelly's career stats. What a great career he's had here at Miami too. Rolling in throws on play action deep into the end zone. It's picked off by Penn State but they say he was out when he picked it off. The deep back who was doing a great job back there for the Nittany Lions of Penn State was Paul Lankford. A uh, 177 pound senior from Farmdale New York. Let's watch again. Brodsky runs his pattern. He sees that uh, Kelly is going to throw the ball. And here's Langford back there. Let's watch if he comes down. He is out of bounds. Good call by the official. 25 mile an hour wind out of the east. And again, it swirls around here in the Orange Bowl at the open end. Second and 18 ball on the 22 yard line for Miami. A split backfield with rush 49. And Kelly throws and he's got rush as rush steps out of bounds along the near side at the 16 yard line. Mark Rushing action at the running back spot at 6-3-2-11. Miami NCAA ranking number 12 in passing offense, gaining a little under 247 yards a game. Steve Sefter was the coverage man for Penn State on the last play. Here is Pitt having a tough time with Boston College this afternoon, and Tulsa rolls over Drake, 59-6. Third and 11, ball on the 15-yard line for Miami. Kelly straight up the middle on the quarterback keeper and goes to the 10 yard line again. It is Scepter who makes the hit. He is a sophomore from New Cumberland, uh, Pennsylvania, fourth down coming up. I would have to think that the University of Miami Hurricanes down close did not want to risk putting the ball in the air uh, with quite a bit of yardage to go for a first down. It's a fourth and 11 or it was fourth, third and 11. Now it's going to be fourth and six. And of course, they've got the awesome foot of Danny Miller, their field goal kicker, number one. And Danny Miller will come in now to attempt the field goal with Greg LaBelle holding. Waiting for the snap. LaBelle will be kneeling on the 18-yard line. So it will be a 28-yard attempt for Miller. His foot is into it, and it's in the air. It's got the distance, and it's good. And Miami jumps out front 3-0 on the number one ranked Nittany Lions at Penn State here in the first quarter of play. Well, three to nothing. It's a good start for Miami. Danny Miller comes through. Great kicker. Yeah, and, and coach, you're in your third year, as we said, kind of the midpoint of, of your mission to win the championship. How are you feeling, not so much about maybe this game, but the program itself uh, in, your, in your quest to win well, the championship? Well, first of all, I was really excited to see our defense shut them down. Kurt Warner and Blackledge on that dual paternal team, and they, we shut them down right there at the 40-yard line. They had to kick that long field goal. And then, of course, we got it and quickly got our three points. At that juncture, I was feeling pretty good because our team had played reasonably well uh, up to this point. I thought our defense was uh, winners and our offense had things to do. But uh, with this game under our belt, if we could get this game under our belt, this would be something that would uh, be the difference. It would be the pivotal game, uh, just like the pivotal game we had up at uh, uh, Penn State with Jim in his first start. This would be another pivotal game if we could get a win. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about the 79 game, and Don, of course, you're, you're a freshman uh, in, in, I think, Howard's first recruiting class. Yeah. And, I mean, how, how did you use that confidence from that win up there to now face in a number one Penn State uh, going into this ballgame? Well, Steve, the victory up at Penn State 1979 verified to every football player that what Coach had been telling us we could get done. But we had to do it better. You know, we had to do it better in 79 after that win. We had to do it better in 80. And then you roll into the Orange Bowl, homecoming, it's Halloween. It's our chance to beat the number one team in America on television in front of everybody and just verify to the nation and also to our city that the University of Miami is going to compete for a national championship. And Coach told us the first day he took the job. 
You, we're going to win a national championship. The only variable is time. And when we marched out on that Orange Bowl turf, we knew we had an opportunity to do something that hasn't been done under Coach Schnellenberger, and we took advantage of it. Oh, you did. And, and Fred, your defense is, you know, thinking back to the 79 game, you know, not a, a great quarterback from Penn State, but now you're facing a very young, uh, talented quarterback in Todd Blackledge. And, and, I mean, how are you feeling about going? To, are you looking at this game as, hey, this is our tipping point for Miami to, to, to springboard or launch into a national championship program? Most definitely. I think when going into the game, all the hype that they had, they're being, they were supposed to be the national champions that year. I think all the sport writers and everybody felt like they would be the team that would play for the national championship. Coming in against us, basically being 4-2, uh, most people felt like we did not have that chance. But within ourselves, we were always a tight-knit team. We felt like we can beat anyone, and we play like that. And I think up in 79, when we beat them up there, Kelly coming in, taking over, it showed us that, hey, look here, we can play with these guys, and we can beat them. And then coming into our backyard, that gave us even a bigger incentive to beat them because you never want to lose at home. But one of the things that I found very fascinating, and I was going to ask Coach this, why do we schedule Penn State on homecoming? <laughs> <laughs> well, they were used to scheduling us on homecoming. <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be good to turn around. We, have been, we had been homecoming for so many years at three or four places during the course of the year. Yeah. But, uh, gosh, didn't that turn out to be just the right thing to do? Best thing you could have God ever done. God takes care of fools, drunks, and uh, young developing fo <laughs> football teams. Well, it, it's great, too. What I love about it is, is you know, we watch that opening uh, segment, and, and here you, know, you got a number one team yes. versus a number 19, and you, you think about how college football is hyped whenever you have a number one matchup. And, sure. and uh, you know, we're going to watch the rest of this game and see how it plays out. But it Ron Harris and Jim Gallagher back at the Orange Bowl where Danny Miller of the University of Miami has just kicked a 28-yard field goal to put the Canes up 3-0. That uh, drive covered 65 yards in 11 plays, consumed 357, and Danny Miller now 11 for 16, kicking field goals this year. Two of those misses from 60 yards or more. So Miller comes through again for the Hurricanes. John Williams, number 44, waits for it on the three-yard line. He's at the 5, the 10, the 11, and stacked up there at the 13-yard line. Bringing him down for Miami, Dallas Cameron, number 64. So uh, Miami special teams unit right down there. Here you're looking at some fine stats for the number one ranked Nittany Lions, number three in rushing, number four in scoring, and number six in total offense. Take a look at that. 440 yards a game total offense. They score about 37 points a game, and defensively they hold the opponents to about nine points per game. That'll tell you why they are ranked number one in the nation. Great, great football team. Todd Blackledge now at quarterback with an eye formation. They're at the 14-yard line. Blackledge gives, goes to Warner. Warner turning outside and stacked up by Lester Williams on the far side. Miami's All-American candidate at the defensive tackle. And here you're looking at a Miami Hurricane fan. Second and four, the ball on the 20-yard line. Second and four. As Warner picks up six. Average is 7.3 yards per carry, scored eight touchdowns and averages just under 168 yards a game. Kurt Warner, what a fine athlete. Again, Warner gets the call coming to the fire side and he is swarmed under by Miami's defense. Tim Flanagan, number 90, was there first. There you're looking at a gentleman who is celebrating Halloween Eve just a little bit early here in the Orange Bowl. The ball will be spotted down on the far side hash mark. It'll be third and one. Well, Kurt Warner, of course, is, is really some, some kind of runner. He's developed into the, one of the finest running backs in Penn State history in two seasons. He gained 922 yards last year, and he's the first uh, Lion sophomore over the career 1,000-yard mark. That hamstring injury really uh, kind of crippled him. Last week he wasn't able to play, but he's back, and he doesn't look like it slowed him up a bit. He didn't get the first down as the Miami defense rose to the occasion right there and stacked him up right at the line of scrimmage. Isaiah West, the big junior from Chicago, Illinois. Number 55 there first for Miami. And the middle of the Miami defense stiffens. Fourth down, and Penn State will kick away. 
Joe Paterno had said coming into this game told us fellows uh, last night at, at the media meeting he said the one thing sure we're not going to be able to jam the ball down their throats this will be the most physical team we have faced yet this year and that includes Nebraska University of Miami traditionally has been defensively just uh, tremendous over the years Ralph Giacomaro will kick averaging just under 44 yards per boot and you can see why as he boots one up there, Lawrence Thompson picks it off at the 22. He's at the 25, hits the corner at the 30. He's at the 35 and across the 40 and brought out of bounds at the 41-yard line and making the stop for Penn State, Ken Kelly, number 98. Well, that win helped out on that kick, 56-yard kick, and uh, just a great return by Lawrence Thompson. Back at the Orange Bowl with the University of Miami Hurricanes, ranked 19th by UPI with a 3-0 lead over the number one ranked Nittany Lions in the early going. 5.48 left in the first quarter, and the Hurricanes, with a tremendous defensive effort, hold on fourth and one, stop Kurt Warner, stack him up, and uh, take over now following the punt on their own 43-yard line. Here come the Hurricanes again. First and 10 for the Canes, Jim Kelly with an eye formation. Speedy Neal, the up back 38, dropping the throw as Kelly's got the time. And out in the flat, he's got Mike Rodriguez on the near sideline at the 41-yard line. Rodriguez, the converted quarterback from Tallahassee, Florida, makes the catch, and Giuseppe Harris makes the stop for Penn State. Well, you give uh, Kelly as much time as that to throw, and he's going he's gonna to deliver it. Rodriguez runs a good pattern here, puts a little juke step on Giuseppe Harris, comes over, and the ball is right there. Beautiful pass again by Kelly. He can be deadly. Ball at the 41, first and 10 for the Canes. They're in Nittany Lion territory. Kelly again to throw. He's got Mark Rush coming out of the backfield, and Rush steps out of bounds on the 32-yard line. And driving him out for Penn State was number 55, and that was Roger, Puzz Roger. Ball at the 32-yard line. It'll be second and one for the Canes of Miami. 5.37 to play in this first quarter, and the Hurricanes are up 3-0 on number one, Penn State, and driving. And here is Jim Kelly, who is from... Penn State country, East Brady, Pennsylvania. Split backfield behind Kelly. The give off goes to Chris Hobbs, and Hobbs has got the first down as he goes down inside the 30 to the 27-yard line. Again, it is Roger making the hit number 55. So little number 33, Chris Hobbs at 5'10", 190, a very small type fullback, a senior from Tallahassee, Florida, makes the carry for the first down against Penn State. First and 10 at the 26. Kelly's got receivers left and right. Kelly gives off to Smokey Roan off the left side, and Penn State was waiting. They diagnosed that one right there at the 25-yard line. Dave Pappenroth, a senior from Stroudsburg, PA, makes the hit. He's number 33, defensive tackle. The passing statistics, all Miami so far in the early going. Kelly, six completions out of 10 attempts for 82 yards. Second down nine for the Canes. Well, they're going with a lot of the short stuff, little intermediate stuff, going to the back side of the backfield. That's what they feel they have to do to move against this very tough Nittany Lion defense. Nittany Lions using two down linemen, four men up front, and dropping the throw is Kelly, and he's going for the end zone deep. And it's going to be a little too far. It was intended for number 49, Mark Rush, coming out of the backfield, and he's a speed burner. And Giuseppe Harris was the coverage man, number 26. If that name Harris and Penn State seem synonymous, well, it's because it is synonymous. Good he play by number 57 for the Penn State Nittany Lions, uh, Kirk Bowman, charging in there from his defensive end position, put a lot of pressure on Kelly and forced him to throw the ball. And I think Kelly really just laid it up there kind of out of reach because it was way out of the end zone. Miami with a 3-0 lead, third and nine. Ball on the 25-yard line. A split backfield and a slot offense to the right side for Kelly again to throw. He unloads, and he's got Rodriguez inside the 10, and Rodriguez drops the ball at the six-yard line. Did not have it in his possession long enough. Well, let's take another look at it. I don't know if he held it long enough or not, but at any rate, it's ruled an incompleted pass. Great protection for Kelly again. And again, it was Kirk Bowman coming in very, very fast, putting pressure on, but he got a good block. And let's watch Rodriguez run his pattern. Flooded two men into that zone. They had Brodsky down there with him. 
And he's wide open, but he never did have control of the ball, so it's a good call by the official. Here we go for the field goal in fourth and nine from the 25. The kick will come from the 32, so it will be a 42-yard attempt by Danny Miller. His foot is into it, and it's got the distance, and it's good! So Miami now has a 6-0 lead on Penn State here in the early going. Number one, Danny Miller. John Williams, number 44, the return man for Penn State, standing at the six-yard line and waiting for the kick, which will come from Danny Miller, whose nickname at the University of Miami is Bigfoot, and you can see why. Canes with a 6-0 lead on number one, Penn State, here in the early going the first quarter. High and deep, and it's going to come to Williams, standing on the nine. He steps across the 10 at the 15. He's upfield at the 20, and across the 20 and out of the 22-yard line before he's hit and uh, brought down by Ronnie Lippett and Albert Bentley. They make the hit for the Canes. So Penn State takes over the football at the 22-yard line, first and 10 now. They're trailing by six points. The Lions are such a good club, however, that they can score from just about anywhere on the field. Not as explosive as some of the teams that Miami has faced, but nonetheless, offensively, a great power. Eye formation for Blackledge now, their fine young quarterback, waiting for the snap. The pitch goes to Warner, and he is straight up the middle and goes across the 25 to the 26-yard line. And David Jefferson makes the tackle. He is a senior riverback from Miami. Bob Nelson, the first man that got a hand on him, number 91. Todd Blackledge, a deceptive passer. He doesn't get to throw the ball all that often, but when he does, he's a 53% uh, completion, 43 uh, completions out of 83 attempts. And he's a, he's a good quarterback. High formation once again on second and six at the 26-yard line for Penn State. Man in motion now to the near side. The handoff goes to the up back. The fullback, Meade, in number 38, carries it straight up the middle. And Lester he is brought down by big Lester Williams. Here it is again. Now look at Lester. Nobody takes him. He's wide open. And he just comes in here and look at him. Smack him. I mean, he hit Meade very, very hard. And Meade just goes back. <laughs> and Lester says, welcome to the Orange Bowl. <laughs> Meade is not a little fella either. 225 pounds of junior from Dover, Delaware. Third and six now for the Nittany Lions on the 26-yard line. Again with the eye formation is Blackledge Miami with a four down lineman and dropping to throw is Blackledge and he throws and he's got Warner coming out of the backfield at the 32 yard line and Warner fights forward to the 35 he's got the first down before David Jefferson puts the hit and the stop on him so Warner is a threat coming out of the backfield too 5'11 195 a junior from Wyoming West Virginia here you're looking at comparison stats Penn State definitely a better rushing team. Miami a better passing team. Totally, Penn State leads the Canes. The Nittany Lions 6-0, and the Canes are 4-2, using the three down linemen. Nicholas Stunning in the gap. The pitch goes to Warner, and he comes up the middle. He is hit first by Bob Nelson, number 91, and uh, finally putting a stop on him is Freddie Marion, 31, but there was a flag on the play at the 35. The illegal procedure against the Penn State Nittany Lions. They're such a disciplined football team that they rarely get those type of um, penalties, but I think somebody jumped on the line on that one. Well, one of the reasons they're such a good football team, Jim, is they don't make many mistakes. They've only had 11 fumbles in six games this year, and they've only lost five of those. So that'll tell you a little bit about uh, how well they, they hold on to the ball, but they don't make many mistakes when it comes to penalties either. They're not a heavily penalized team. They're very disciplined, a typical Joe Paternal team. First and 15, the ball on the 30-yard line. Blackledge has an eye formation, receivers left and right. Blackledge drops the throw, throws, and it is cut at the 45-yard line, and they rule that it is a completion. I think the Miami fans are thinking that it may not have been complete to Mike McCloskey. We're going to take a look at the replay. It looked very close, but McCloskey made a nice grab no matter what the uh, situation is. Good play action by Blackledge. Now let's take a look at it. He caught it. Yeah, it's a completion. There's no doubt about that. So that gives the Lions a first down, first and 10 at the 45-yard line. They've got the football smack dab in the middle of the field, an equal distance from the two sidelines. Again, eye formation with receivers left and right. 
And one or the up back in their eye. Blackledge drops the throw. He's got the time and delivers. Got his man. 35-yard line and brought down at the 34. Catching the football for Penn State was number 82. Their fine split end, Kenny Jackson, a sophomore from South River, New Jersey. Let's take another look. Here's the pitch. He had a couple of men wide open. Freddie Marion comes up, makes the, makes the tackle. But it was a good play. Kenny Jackson out of South River, New Jersey. Ran a good route. Nice catch. Ball delivered right on the numbers by Blackledge. First and 10 at the 33-yard line of Miami for the Nittany Lions as they drive on the Hurricanes. The Hurricanes up 6-0. Blackledge and the center bobbled a snap, and there are flags on the play. I think an illegal procedure may be coming against Penn State. It is. They're going to march off another five. Despite the penalties on this drive, Penn State's starting to catch up to the University of Miami in the first down department. Penn State now has four. The Canes have five. Here are the referees. Paul Schmidt, the referee. Foster Gross, Jr., the umpire. Linesman Joe Pipkin. Line judge Alvin Kelly. Field judge Weldon Waits. And back judge Jim Campbell. Ball at the 39-yard line. First and 15 for the Nittany Lions. Receivers left and right for Todd Blackledge, their quarterback in an eye formation. Meet the up back and the tailback is Warner. The give off goes to Warner and Warner is hit by Bob Nelson brought down behind the line. First guy to get a hand on him in there for Miami was Tim Flanagan, a senior from Woodbridge, Virginia, number 90. The final hit made by Bob Nelson, the big senior from Dundalk, Maryland at 6-3 and 250. The Miami skyline. A windy day in the Orange Bowl as the seconds tick away here in the first quarter. And it rained most of the morning here. We've had gusty winds and uh, rain showers throughout the day. The field is wet. Second and 15, the ball remains on the 39-yard line. Again, the eye formation for Blackledge. Dropping the throw. And he unloads out in the flat, and it is incomplete. It was intended for Kenny Jackson. Lester Williams putting a lot of pressure on Blackledge on that uh, last pass. And so it falls as incomplete. Great play by Jimmy Boone, too, back there. And uh, he was kind of... <laughs> Kind of pushing the receiver around a little bit. I thought for a moment there might be a flag down, but uh, they put Blackledge had all day to throw, and then then the pressure came. You can't stand back there all day. But good coverage by the Kings in the secondary. Good play by Jamie Boone. It remains third and 15 with 12 seconds to play in the first quarter. Miami up 6-0. Todd Blackledge at the line. They've got a wing to the left side. Blackledge 14 to throw, and he throws, and he's got his man complete and brought down at the 30-yard line. It was complete to Mike McCloskey, the junior receiver from Philadelphia. David Jefferson, number 37, made the tackle. He's a senior from Miami at the Roverback spot. That's like the weak safety in most defenses. But Miami gives him the freedom defensively to go wherever he wants to go. Well, all right, we'll be back with the second quarter action. Well, it's an interesting ball game. It's six to nothing now. And, you know, from watching this game and watching the 79 game, you could see that Miami was more athletic. And, and so let's just talk a little bit about the recruiting. You, of course, have been there, but how did you originally get to Miami? Well, I came in, uh, Lou Saban recruited me, and uh, I grew up in Gainesville, and uh, Charles Cook, who also was a defensive back, when he came back from uh, Miami, they had turned him into a lineman. That's how defensive much back. weight. He, he was a defensive back. Uh, they recruited him as, two, and then he uh, came back. 240, didn't he? Yes, he was, but they yeah. converted him uh, into a defensive tackle. Yeah. And uh, But my thing was, growing up in Gainesville, I've seen the Gators all my life. I was five minutes away from campus. And one of the things that lured me to University of Miami was saving vow that we were going to get our degree. That was one of the biggest things that he, uh, he stressed education. If you were on the field and you had a class or test, you better get off the field and go and take that. Another thing was that they were an independent. They played against the top teams in the country. And as a kid, I always wanted to play against the best, yeah. you know, because I think sometimes that's how your talent is measured when you go up against the best. Okay. And 
So Penn, the rest Penn is State, history. Notre Dame, Alabama. Always. Always. You know, of course, he, he furthered that when he said in, anybody, anywhere, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I bet you like playing in that Orange Bowl, too, didn't you? I love playing in the Orange Bowl. You know, it was just something about the OB. I mean, it was uh, that was our backyard, and they say every dog is bad in his own backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys were bad. And, Don, you're, you're in Howard's first recruiting class there, I guess, and was that 79, spring of 79? 1979. Can you believe the only Dade County athlete in the entire class? That tells you. <laughs> the oh, state of the University of Miami at that time, but uh, Joe Brodsky, the late Joe Brodsky, and uh, my father played high school football together, and Brodsky was my coach at Hialeah Miami Lakes, and he left Miami Lakes to go to the University of Miami, and he and Arnie Romero mm -hmm. were the guys that were rec uh, recruiting me at Hialeah Miami Lakes, and I was being recruited, similar like Fred, under Coach Saban, and Coach Saban left, and both of those guys, Brodsky and Romero, said, listen, you got to hang on here a second. We've got to see who's going to be the head coach before we tell you which way to go. So did Coach Brodsky came in with Howard's staff? He, no, he was actually, yeah. he was, he, he was he was actually there with Saban okay. and, and, coach, and Coach Kepham, and uh, Larry Brodsky was there already. So Coach uh, Saban leaves, and everything kind of laid low for a while, and then Coach Schnellenberger got the job, and Coach Brodsky and Coach Romero said, this is the right guy. You're getting your butt down to the University of Miami. And sure enough, there I came. Yeah. Well, it was uh, certainly a success for you. Well, I tell you what, it was, hard. it was hard to try to figure out what to do. But I decided that recruiting kids from, uh, from uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio and New Jersey, bringing back the second best from up there was not the way to go. And I think if I did anything at the University of Miami to ensure stability and, and ensure the ability to win games, was to focus on what we call the state of Miami. And there was only five counties to start with, Dade, Palm Beach, uh, Broward, Lee, and Collier. And then each year after that, we would annex in the still of the night by acclamation uh, counties further and further north. So finally, we got Orlando and Tampa and that whole thing. But if you look at it uh, from that 1979 period to now, uh, the amount of players that have gone to the University of Miami from South Florida and from some above the, the line. Uh, that's what's been the reason for the dynasty. Not the fact that we had five or six different coaches, but the reason the players have become the, the dynasty. They go back to the high school. They are the ones that ensure, just like they did this year, you, you hear them for the first time in a long time, we call so-and-so talking about some of the players. We call so-and-so the signees, yeah. and they got a group together down there. Now, how good they are, I don't know, but I'll bet you they'll be a lot better than the ones they used to go out and get up there and where you came from. Exactly. <laughs> well, you can, you can get a few guys. Diamonds in the roughs, yeah. maybe. But you know, the bottom line is the coaches have to develop. I mean, your staff uh, is great at developing players, and that was really the key, I think, for Miami. You got the great talent, but then you developed them. And, and, and certainly it's evidence in this ball game. And when we come back, Penn State's going to try for a 47-yard field goal, and we'll start the second quarter. Back at the Orange Bowl, the Miami Hurricanes with a 6-0 lead over the number one ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. And that's the score here at the end of the first quarter as we get ready for second quarter action. And a significant thing has happened here, Jim. Brian Franco, their field goal kicker, uh, is going to have to kick now into the teeth of that wind gusting in here from the open end of the Orange Bowl. But I would imagine having done games up in uh, Pennsylvania there in Nittany Valley that the old winds whip up there pretty good too. So he's used to kicking in the wind. Fourth and seven is the situation. The ball is spotted down on the 30. The kick is going to come from the 36-yard line, so it'll be a 46-yard attempt. And uh, the holder, number 16, is Terry Rakowski, waiting for the snap. Brian Franco, number 10, a fine field goal kicker for the Penn State Nittany Lions. Foot is into it, and it's going to be short. Ron, you called it. The wind is a factor. Well, you take a look at it. Uh, I'm telling you, that wind just held it up. The ball got off. He got a good foot into it. He, uh, of course, uh, Brian Franco is uh, a tremendous place kicker. Uh, he was Herb Menhart's backup the last two years, and he's taken over the chores this year, but, boy, that wind blowing held the ball up, and that cost him three points. After an exchange of punts, we pick up action later in the second quarter. Hurricanes ball, first and 10 at their own 38. We are back at the Orange Bowl in Miami, Florida. The Penn State Nittany Lions down 6 0 to a very aggressive University of Miami football team. The University of Miami, two field goals by Danny Miller, and that has been the difference so far. Mark Richt is now in a quarterback for the University of Miami. Number nine, he's a junior from Boca Raton, Florida. 
Hands off to Chris Hobbs. Hobbs off the right side and across the 40-yard line from the 38 to the 41. A three-yard pickup for number 33, Chris Hobbs. And there was a flag on the play. Dave Ofar made the hit for Penn State, and their call just went against Penn State. I think it's going to be um, an offsides call. Well, it was offsides. Number 69, the defensive tackle, the kid out of Houston, Texas, 6'1", 251 pounds, junior, came blasting through and was in the backfield practically before the ball was, was snapped. So it was Newski was offsides on that play, and uh, the officials caught him. First and five, ball on the 43-yard line. Rick remains in at quarterback, the split backfield behind him. He's got receivers left and right. And Rick drops back again, flags, and I think it's going to be the same gentleman. That is correct. Was Newski blast through there again? Rick has come into the ball game, and you have to think now that Mark Rick has, he has learned that stutter call from Earl Morrow, the quarterback coach for the University of Miami, and he's, uh, when he starts barking that call and changes the cadence, here comes Wisniewski twice, and, and he's got a new quarterback, and he, he got a little used to hearing uh, the kid out of East Brady, Kelly, call it, and now he's got Rick in there with a different cadence, and it's caught him twice now. So it'll be first and five for the Canes at the 43-yard line. As a Mark Rick waits for the snap with a split backfield behind him and receivers left and right. Rick gives and his give goes to Chris Hobbs who comes around the near side but there were flags on the play again. And it's Wisniewski again. And again that cadence has to have the uh, Penn State Nittany Lions uh, defensively a little bit off guard here. Now watch number is that 69 or 59? That's, That's 69, 69 right there and uh, Wisniewski three times in a row. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> right there in front of everybody. Has good technique. <laughs> Another first down for the Hurricanes. Well, as you say, Ron, changing the quarterbacks changes the cadence, and then all of Miami's quarterbacks have definitely benefited by being coached by Earl Morrow. First and ten, ball on the 48-yard line, a split backfield now behind Mark Richt. They're in Miami territory, and the Canes are up 6-0 with 10.26 to play here in the second quarter. Rick to throw, looks and throws, and he is incomplete. Had Brodsky along the sideline, and Brodsky got up and had a hand on it, but it was a little bit too high for him to hang on to. Larry Brodsky, who needs only 44 yards this afternoon to become the Hurricanes' all-time leading receiver to pass Bill Miller and uh, Jimmy Cox as the all-time receiving leader at Miami. Well, Brodsky is not the biggest man, not the fastest man, but he's got a great pair of hands. He runs a pretty good route. He's a step or two slow, but the guy has great determination and just great concentration. Reminds me of Howard Twilley. All he does well is catch the ball That's all right. the time. Mark Rick dumps that one out to Chris Hobbs. 33. Hobbs across the midfield stripe. He's at the 55, the 40. He could go. He's at the 30. And he's across the 20, inside the 20 to the 17-yard line. Chris Hobbs takes that little swing pass coming out of the backfield and races inside the 20 down to the 17-yard line before Paul Lankford pulls him down from behind. Great play. They really set this up well. Everybody coming was Newski bearing in on Kelly, but Kelly has set up the screen just absolutely perfect. And here comes Hobbs with a whole host of blockers out in front of him, and he really turns it on. He's only got one man to beat, just one man to beat, and he can't quite get away from him. Paul Lankford coming in to make the stop, and that's a touchdown saving tackle. Paul Lankford. Did a fine job on that when he's a 177-pound senior from Farmingdale, New York. A lot of speed on this Penn State team, much more than in years past. First and 10 for the Canes at the 17-yard line. The pitch to Smokey Roan, who's to the 10-yard line of Penn State before he is hit and brought down by Roger Jackson. A couple of Hurricane fans in the mood for... <laughs> Halloween. The mood for Halloween. <laughs> second and three ball on the 10 yard line. Now Miami up 6-0 here in the second quarter on number one, Penn State. The Nittany Lions 6 0 coming in. Miami 4 and 2. There is Lorenzo Smokey Road. High formation. The up back is Chris Hobbs, 33. The pitch goes to Roan. And Roan hit and drops the ball at the 18-yard line, but they blew the play dead. 
it's going to remain Miami's ball. Well, Matt Bradley met him and hit him hard. Bradley out of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, 6'1", 210 pounds senior. Let's watch it and see if uh, the officials haven't. They call it this time. Uh, he's done. His knee is down. That's that's why they call it. Knee was down. Good call again by the officials. Third and six at the 13 yard line for Miami. A split backfield behind Mark Rick. Receivers left and right number six at the bottom of the year screen there is Mike Rodrigue. Rick looks to throw and it is intercepted by Penn State out in the flat. Intercepted by number 12 and he is racing towards the Miami end zone Paul Lankford and he is still on his feet and finally brought down on the far sideline by Chris Hobbs number 33 who came all the way across to get him. Well there was a foul up on the pattern Jim Brodsky was running a pattern turned the wrong way Kelly delivered the ball where he was supposed to be he wasn't there Langford was wide open or Mark Rick excuse me, he uh, delivered the ball Rick uh, passes right here little mix up on the uh, on the pattern and nobody to stop Langford and I think that the University of Miami deserves some credit for recovering because he should have been gone with that one. Yes now he here's is. Rick delivering right here and you can see Brodsky went the other way. He threw it where he thought Brodsky would be and Langford makes a great interception and now the Nittany Lions have a deep in Miami territory. The give off goes to Kurt Warner who is hit and brought down behind the line of scrimmage at the 28 yard line brought down by Tim Flanagan number 90 the big senior from Woodbridge Virginia Howard Snellenberger along the sidelines exhorting his defensive unit. Here's young Mr. Lankford happy about uh, his good fortune. He was right there. That's his second interception this year and he's a good athlete. You can see why he makes him. He played that last play very very well. Second and 11 ball remaining at the 30 yard line. Blackledge the quarterback with a split backfield dropping to throw being rushed and dumps a quick one out to Warner Warner's at the 30 he's across the 25 inside the 20 and he's bumped out of bounds on the far sideline and he was across the 20 to the 17 or 18 yard line Jay Brophy a sophomore linebacker from Akron Ohio number 54 ran him out of bounds. You know you take a look at Langford with that return again and you you have to realize he's also a track star at Penn State and they're lucky they caught him to slow it down and but now the Nittany Lions uh, can taste it and here they come. First and 10 at the 16 yard line of Miami and the Lions are knocking on the door. They've got a wing to the left side in the slot. Receivers left and right. The give off goes to Meade. Meade rips right up the middle and fights to the five yard line before he's brought down. Ready Marion the free safety a senior from Gainesville brings him down number 31. Mike Meade their fullback doesn't carry the ball that much. But at All 225 right. pounds, he's got some size. Well, I guess he does. He's backed up uh, Matt Suey, who's now with the Bears, Booker Moore with the Buffalo Bills at fullback. He's finally getting a shot this year, and uh, he feels he's earned it. He's had to back up some tough, tough competition, <laughs> and that was a great play. He just burst through there and carried a couple of tacklers with him. First and goal on the five-yard line. Give off goes to Warner, and Warner's inside the five of the four-yard line. Middle of the Miami line there to uh, make the hit. Bob Nelson first number 91 got a lot of help on that play Warner moves the ball into the four yard line he is the up back second and goal on the three yard line Blackledge the quarterback gives it to Meade and Meade fights but is brought down and again it is Bob Nelson number 91 that makes the tackle along with Tony Fitzpatrick 62 in those tackle sophomore from St. Petersburg Florida third and goal ball just inside the two yard line. Third and goal for Penn State. Big play. Blackledge chance the signals. I formation made the up back. Warner top of the eye. Warner gets the call, gets the pitch. Drill behind the line at the five by Nelson, who slices in. Makes a great play for Miami. Bob Nelson came to play today. No doubt about it. He's made three or four outstanding tackles so far. Joe Paterno very unhappy and Schnellenberger looking at it. And I can see just a little bit of satisfaction there. Like, doggone it, guys. Hang in there. Miami's got a tough defense against the run. There's no doubt about that. 
Well, that was a big, big tackle by Nelson. That turns it around from six, maybe seven points to just three, and will leave the Canes hold on to a lead. 22-yard attempt for Franco. Ball is at the 12-yard line. His foot is into it. It's in the air, and it's no good. Off to the side. No good. Miami's defense has held. Just a tremendous uh, defensive effort by the Hurricanes and the entire defensive unit. Penn State missing a golden opportunity to score a touchdown thanks to a great defensive play by Bob Nelson. Had to settle for a 22-yard field goal attempt by Brian Franco. That wind swirling around down here in the open end of the Orange Bowl. And incredibly, he missed a little chip shot. And the score remains. Miami Hurricanes 6, Penn State nothing. You would think, Jim, with that play by Lankford intercepting the Mark Brick pass and returning it all the way back down to the 30-yard line, and then with Warner running well, that... Uh, they were going to put some points on the board, but it just didn't happen. And Paterno's really got to be upset about that. There's Brian Franco, and he's got to be upset with himself. First and 10 for Miami. Ball on the 20-yard line in their own territory. Jim Kelly in at quarterback once again for the Canes, replacing Mark Rick. Kelly to throw. He's got time and unloads, and he's got Brodsky at the midfield strike. He's at the 40, the 35, the 30, the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5, and he's in the end zone for the score. 80 yards for Larry Brodsky on a reception. Line of scrimmage to 20. Larry Brodsky's longest reception, and it went for a touchdown, too, before this, was 81 yards. Just a tremendous play, Jim. <laughs> Incredible. And Brodsky, who we said is not too fast, you tell me that now. The man turned it on and outran everybody, but he was wide open. He also became the Hurricanes' all-time leading pass receiver for yardage going past Bill Miller and Jimmy Cox. Wow, what a great play. He is really happy with himself, too. They're going to go for two. Miami's up 12-0 on number one Penn State. And they're going to go for the two. Here's Kelly. He's got his two biggest backs, Robert Speedy Neal at 245, and Mark Rush, number 49, at 215 behind him. But he drops the throw. He looks and throws, and he's got Rodriguez for two. Mike Rodriguez, a converted quarterback from Tallahassee, Florida, in the end zone, wide open, as Jim Kelly connects for two. And the Canes are up 14 to nothing here in the Orange Bowl on the number one team in the country. Hey, things are looking good. 14 nothing Miami. Great touchdown pass there to Larry Brodsky. But, Coach, i got to go back to that Mark Richt interception. What are you putting Mark Richt in for? Well, you know, we have a way that we uh, uh, bring quarterbacks along. You can't just put a, let a guy finish up games and think he's going to be ready to play the following year. You've got to get him a series that when the, com when the game's on the line, the, com the com contact is high so that he gets that game experience. And uh, we, b we bite the bullet sometimes. Sometimes they get in trouble. Other times uh, they do well. But the biggest thing are learning uh, OJT on the job training uh, right. in a tough situation. And it's what we've always done and continue to do this to this day. Well, as, as a quarterback, I think I, I feel a little upset that I'm yanked out of the game. I'm beating the net, you know, number one ranked team, 14 nothing, or, or I guess it was 6 nothing at the time, and, and uh, you get pulled out. But I guess it inspired Jim because he comes back and throws a great ball. Well, uh, Jim, knew, Jim knew that it was going to happen. It wasn't anything surprising to him. He may dislike it, but uh, no, that's good. I like for him to dislike <laughs> it. But uh, it's, it's the only way I know to get your second string quarterback ready to play when it time comes to win yeah might help you understand Steve that coach was platooning uh, started that when he first got to Miami he put the second group in get him excited about getting in a game get excited about practice every week and, and give him an opportunity but what people may not remember is Mark Rick that time he came in and drew Penn State off sides three times in a row Miami you know working that snap count he drew him off three times in that ball game but uh, I guess as coach said off there Mark Rick Looks like he coaches a little better than he throws the football. <laughs> well, you know, what, I'm did sorry, you, Coach. All right, let me just ask real quick about Mark. Did you see anything in him that thought, you thought he would be as successful a coach as he is? I mean, the offensive mind? Well, yes, just... he's a very good-looking guy to start with. He speaks well. He uh, knows how to pick good-looking wives. And uh, 
<laughs> and uh, he uh, he's a student of the game, and uh, I'm not surprised. He had a great tutor for all those years up there at Florida State, and uh, was a, one of the big reasons why they won. Uh, they won with our offense, but uh, that's all right. We lend it out and let somebody <laughs> else use it. Hey, I won with your offense. You're yeah, already you already gone. So. It, 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 isn't it easy? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and you faced you know, a lot of these offensive guys in practice and spring practice. I mean, what did you think of some of that offensive talent that Miami had? Well, I thought we had great talent. I mean, you know, we were like, we didn't have, if you would uh, compare them against some of the guys throughout the, 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 the country, we did not have maybe the ones that the pros would say, wow, but we had guys who actually was that diamond in the rough, so to speak. Uh, prime example, uh, Glenn Dennison, who had the great hands. I mean, he would catch anything coming within this area. He was a great receiver. Uh, but one of the things that I think our offense uh, enabled me to do uh, is to adapt to the NFL because we, we face a pro-style offense. We ran a pro-style defense, and the transition was great for me because it was just a change of terminology. Sure. And you know, Steve, offensively, one thing that we picked up on when Coach took over was that we knew going into any ball game that we were never going to be outsmarted. Yeah. That, that Coach Schnellenberger was going to have a plan that would put us in a position to win. Now, whether we could execute it with the Brotskys and the Baileys and the Walters and that type of talent, you know, I mean, you, you don't know, but he, he was a guy that you offensively you knew you had an opportunity to win. Yes, sure. Well, let's see here. Let's see if we uh, keep Miami in a position to win as we come back with the rest of the second quarter. So Miami's Danny Miller will kick off. That's Sebastian the Ibis, and he's happy about the Canes being up 14-0. Keep in mind, Penn State averages 37 points per game. Uh, holding their opponents to only nine points per okay. game. In fact, they hold their opponents to about 143 yards passing, and they've held their opponents on an average to 121 yards rushing, so the Canes are doing it to them. Williams drops down on one knee after taking the deep kick from Danny Miller. Miller had the wind behind him. He's got the foot to put it in the end zone, but he had a lot of wind behind him that time, too. So Williams wisely drops down to one foot. The ball will come out to the 20, and the Nittany Lions will put it in play. Larry Brodsky. His pop is sitting up here in the booth. He's a happy man, too. His dad is the backfield coach for the University of Miami. First and 10, ball at the 20. Blackledge is the quarterback, number 38. The up back is Mike Mead. High formation receivers left and right. The giveoff goes to Kurt Warner, turning outside, and he is upfield across the 25 of the 26 yard line before he's brought down by David Jefferson, 37. The uh, rover back, or as we mentioned a little bit earlier, most teams would call it a weak safety for Miami, but they give him just such a good athlete, they give him the freedom to do whatever he wants to. He has, as they say in the radio television business, the freelancer. Second and three, ball on the 27-yard line. The eye formation once again, and the wide side would be to the right for Penn State, the bottom of your screen. Miami digging in. Five-man front being used by the Canes. I got two linebackers right in the gaps. The give-off goes to Warner once again, and he's stacked up right at the line of scrimmage by the nose tackle, Tony Ciccolo. Well, I'll give him maybe a yard on the play. I've got him at 13 carries for 29 yards, and he's averaging just under 168 yards per game, so the Canes have really shut him down. He's the third leading rusher in the nation behind Marcus Allen of Southern Cal and behind Herschel Walker of Georgia. So the Canes are doing something right defensively when they can shut a runner like this down. Uh, as we say, he's coming off a hamstring injury. He did not play last week. Williams had a great week, gained 146 yards. And now they're helping him off, and it looks like he might have re-injured that hamstring. That would be a big blow for the Nittany Lions. High formation receivers left and right for Blackledge, third and three on the 27. And they're in their own territory. Blackledge the throw. He delivers in the near flat at the 41 yard line and they're going to mark it as a completion to Greg Garrity. <laughs> Miami crowd is booing. They think it uh, might have been trapped but we'll take a look and see. Well, now we're taking a look here at uh, Blackledge giving off to uh, Warner on the play previous to this one. And you could see him pull up right there as just before Chicolo hit him, he reached back and grabbed his leg. So apparently he has re-pulled that hamstring and he's in agony over there on the sidelines. Oh, that's a tough break for one of the premier runners in the country. First and 10 for Penn State at the 41. Blackledge is hit. 
and drill behind the line and getting in there to hit him is Big Tim Flanagan, big senior from Woodbridge, Virginia. Every time Jim makes a big play or the defense makes a big play, he stands, raises both hands in the air, and the crowd goes wild. He is truly the cheerleader. Now we're taking another look as we're working on Kurt Warner over there, untaping him, getting all the tape off. He was heavily taped up before the game. Second and 10 at the 41-yard line. Miami up 14-0. Split backfield now behind Blackledge. The pitch goes to Williams, and Williams turns the corner on the far side and gets good yardage up near the midfield stripe as he goes to about the 48-yard line. Hey, he's a good player. He averages 4.4 per carry, and that's not bad. And, you know, you take a look at this team. They, they depend on the rush more than they depend on the pass, but Blackledge can throw the ball, too. Uh, he's good for uh, 107 yards, 9 of 13 today, but if you look over at Kelly on the other side, Kelly's 8 of 14 for 167, so that's a big telling statistic. And, of course, uh, 80 yards on that touchdown to Brodsky picked up a big chunk. Third and two at the 49-yard line for Penn State. The give goes to Williams, and Williams is met at the line and brought down by David Jefferson. And Jefferson, as we mentioned, plays what Miami calls Rover, so they allow him to freelance, and he comes in from the left side and makes the hit as he blitzes. Here is Kurt Warner, very, very unhappy about what has happened to him today, and I don't blame him. He's a great athlete and has had a great career at Penn State, doing so well this year. Jim, he's not only unhappy, he's in a lot of pain. Penn State in punt formation now. Their punter, Giacomaro, drops back. Fourth and two at the 49. His kick will come from about the 40, and he gets it up there high and hangs it up. The wind catches it a little bit, but it's going to roll, and uh, let's see. They say that it went into the end zone, so it'll be blown dead and come out to the 20. First and 10 for the Hurricanes at their own 20-yard line. Jim Kelly, the quarterback. Quarterback sneak goes straight up the middle to the 24-yard line. So Kelly today is 8 for 14, 166 yards, one touchdown, an 80-yarder to Larry Brodsky. Well, there's the stat I was telling you about, see? Penn State's given up 143 yards per game passing, and already the Canes have passed that up. So they are sticking to their game plan and getting it done. High formation for Kelly. The give goes to Smokey Roan. He rips up the middle, and he's got the first down as he goes across the 30-yard line of the 31. Mark Robinson, the free safety, 32, makes the tackle. Roan had a good hole and was able to go up the middle. And the seconds tick away here with uh, about a minute, as you can see, 145 to go in the first half. And Miami up 14-0. I think, uh, Ron, they're going to try to maybe keep it on the ground until they get a little bit better field position. Penn State was looking past there, and uh, Miami fooled him with a couple of runs. Now, Kelly to throw, and he throws long for Rodrigue, and he almost had him at the 25-yard line. Mike Rodrigue, running a deep pattern, had split the zone, and was right there. Kelly, just a little too much muscle. Well, let's take another look at it. Here's Rodrigue going out. Boy, look at him run his pattern. It's a post pattern. And he is right between two receivers. The ball is just slightly overthrown. And of course, there's that strong wind at Kelly's back. Otherwise, I think he'd have had him right on the numbers. They had, uh, let's see, Giuseppe Harris was back there and Roger Jackson both doing a good job of defending. And the pass slightly overthrown. Ball remains at the 32. It's second and 10 for the Canes. Split backfield behind Jim Kelly. And the give off goes to Roan, who comes to the near side. He's across the 40 and across the 45 to the 46 yard line. I'd like to know what has happened to the Penn State defensive rush. Kelly had all day to throw that ball a couple of moments ago, and now here we see it again. Great blocking by the offensive line of the University of Miami Hurricanes, and uh, Roan turns the corner, and here he comes, and he picks up another first down, so the Canes are mixing it up well. As they move the football to the 46-yard line, they're still operating in their own territory, and there's a split backfield behind Kelly, who now drops the throw. He's got the time, and he's going to go long. He's going for the bomb to Brodsky, and he almost had him at the four-yard line. Oh, oh. Brodsky getting good coverage, though, over there by Paul Lankford, who's playing a good game. He was the young man who picked off the ball and intercepted it a while ago. So Lankford had him pretty well covered, but Brodsky was right there, too. It would have been a battle. Well, Lankford uh, got burned by Brodsky on that 80-yard touchdown pass, and here again, just slightly overthrown, and I've been... 
talking about this wind. That wind is a factor here. I, we have seen uh, the University of Miami play a lot of games this year, and uh, Kelly on those long ones is generally right on the money. Paterno is uh, not happy along the sideline. I'm sure he'll have some words to say at the half to his troops. Dropping back as Kelly dumps a quick one out to Roan. Roan's at the 45 and across the midfield stripe and into Penn State territory to about the, call it the 49-yard line where he's bumped out of bounds by the right side linebacker, Matt Bradley, 86. Big senior from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Less than a minute to play in the first half. Hurricanes trying, I would think, to get into field goal position, if nothing else. They've gone for the bomb a couple times now, and they've come very close. They just missed Rodriguez on a deep post pattern. They just missed Brodsky on a fly pattern. And now they're going with some of the short stuff, probably trying to set up a Miller field goal uh, with a third down situation. They'll probably go for something short. Kelly dropping to throw again, being chased, and throws long for Lawrence Thompson. And there again, just a little bit too far. Lawrence Thompson was deep. He's a flyer on the outside. He made his first catch last week against East Carolina. It was for a touchdown. Do you think that the defensive secondary of the Penn State Nittany Lions are beginning to think that the Canes will throw the ball three bombs in a row they've gone for, and they've almost completed every one of them? Well, they've had a lot of work to do this afternoon, but they've got some good athletes back there, and they have an experienced secondary. Fourth and six, ball at the midfield stripe. Greg LaBelle to punt. He is a junior from Danielson, Connecticut. Originally came to the University of Miami to play baseball. Standing at the 35-yard line, a high snap. And LaBelle picks it up at the 20 and is going to run with it to the far side and turns up field to the 30 to the 32-yard line. So Greg LaBelle made a good recovery on what could have been a disastrous situation as um, the snap went high and... Uh, LaBelle was chased down by Leo Wisniewski, number 69. He was a young man who jumped out of, uh, jumped off sides three times a while ago, but he made up for it right there. A couple of weeks ago, same thing happened when uh, LaBelle went back to punt, and they asked Schnellenberger if he was trying to take an intentional safety, and that's what happened a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> this time, uh, they won't ask this question. <laughs> he was way out there. The ball was obviously snapped over his head. Now they've gone to the split backfield once again. Black ledge with receivers left and right, and he drops the throw. He's got the time, and he unloads, and it is complete to the 20-yard line. Complete to the 20-yard line, and as he has his man, Greg Garrity, the junior from Bradford Woods, Pennsylvania, number 19. Watch Garrity as he runs his pattern here now, and Garrity, on almost uh, every play where he's caught the ball, he's come back up to catch the ball. That uh, seems to be his patented process of catching it. He runs his pattern, turns around, then comes back up to, uh, to pull it in. First and 10 at the 18-yard line. Again, Blackledge looks to throw, throws, and he's got his man at the 6-yard line. Number 81, Mike McCloskey, that junior receiver from Philadelphia. McCloskey's fourth catch of the ball game. He's a good one. Really a solid player. Okay, here we go. First and goal at the six-yard line. Blackledge with an eye formation. Now they go to the split backfield behind him. Williams 44 and Meade 38. Meade gets the call. He hit inside the five at the four-yard line by Bob Nelson 91 and Tony Ciccolo 71. That play ate up only five yards, so now they've got 11 seconds remaining. Second and goal at the four. Penn State knocking on Miami's door. Eye formation and Blackledge 14 at the line. Blackledge to throw, looking, throws for the end zone high. It's going to go out. Six seconds to play now in the first half. Bob Nelson really putting the pressure on. And it might be mentioned that Flanagan and Lippett were back there on the coverage, and uh, both fellows, when they saw the ball was thrown high, just backed off everything and let the ball go out of bounds or out of the end zone, so they didn't get any kind of a penalty call there and move it right up to the one-yard line where they have a good shot at punching it across. He's going to go for it. Third down. High formation, meet the up back 38. Now they go to the wing. Garrity on the wing to the left side. He comes now in motion to the near side. Blackledge rolling, looking for somebody on play action. Blackledge may try to run it in, and he is stopped short of the goal line as the clock runs out. Well, the Hurricanes defense comes through again, and it was Tony Ciccolo throwing his whole body into Blackledge, 
When Blackwood saw everybody was covered, he didn't want to throw into the crowd. He said, maybe I've got a shot at making it myself. It looked like he was going to get over, and Chicolo, number 71, came up and stopped him. So Penn State comes up empty for the first half. Now that's how you play defense. Well, you guys had some talent on that defense, <laughs> oh, too. Oh, yes, we did. I mean, did. Lester Williams, uh, Ronnie L Lippett or Lippett. I, which one is it? I know him as Lippett when he first came in. <laughs> well, he was, he was Lippett until he got drafted in the National Football yeah, League. He was going a little French on his yeah, coach, Lippett. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Scott Nicholas, you know, they, they mentioned in the game, becomes the all-time leading tackler passing up Ted Hendricks. So Scott certainly had a great uh, career at Miami as well. And you get to practice against them in well, spring ball. You think about this defense. I mean, you look at the defensive line. Lester Bobo Williams, mm -hmm. a first-round draft pick. Yes. Tony Ciccolo drafted by Tampa Bay. Bob Nelson, uh, the Green Bay Packers. You mentioned Scott Nicholas played yes. 10 or 12 years in the National Football League. Lippitt, Bellinger, Jefferson, Marion. I mean, this defense, there was eight guys on that defense that day on that field that got drafted in the National Football League. Well, nothing is any better when you've got a red-hot uh, offense led by Jim Kelly. Uh, you know you're going to have some interceptions. You know you're going to have drop balls, but you know you can score quick. But whenever you have those turnovers, that, that rock hard defense can come out there and shut it down, make up for that er error. And that combination with great special teams makes you hard to beat. Well, I think you know, you, when you think about University of Miami football, you, the offense does get all the glory and all the headlines, but that defense has always been that backbone of those national championship seasons. Absolutely. That's well, been tradition. I mean, the speed uh, and the quickness on defense that Miami has always been known for, we had that that year with the guys we have on defense. And you think about this ball game. As good as Penn State was, they were top ten in every category offensively. They could not run outside against this Miami defense that day. And Coach would tell us, our, the offensive coaches would tell us, if you can move the ball on our defense, on the University of Miami defense, you can win a lot of football games. Problem, it was hard to move them on those guys at practice. I mean, they were tough defense every single day. Well, see, another thing that people don't know, we were really short on players when we came down there. And uh, we always practiced like the Miami Dolphins practice because we run their offense, we run the defense, and we practice like like professionals. We didn't practice like other colleges do. We go best against best as much as we can. Uh, blitz drill, uh, short yardage, anything that was something that's really important, we would go best against best and then give them ten plays and then give the second unit maybe three to five plays. And uh, that's the reason why in the years that we've been in, in this thing at Miami, uh, if you combine Miami and Louisville, those 15 years, uh, we've got 77 kids that were drafted in the National Football League. Yeah. Well, and you look at the depth, and you see, you hear in this game some of those names that you hear later on and into the 83 championships. You know, Roddy Bell Bellinger's starting here, but Jay Brophy coming off the bench, Kenny Calhoun playing on special teams. Some of these names have become the starters. So when you have that depth, they're pushing everybody up, and that's what you that's what made it a great defense. Nice. That's very much so. so, well, when we come back, we're going to have the second half of this gridiron great. After a couple of Penn State punts, sandwiched around a Miami punt, we pick up action later in the third quarter. Hurricanes ball, first and ten at the Penn State 47. And we are back at the Orange Bowl where, just as we took a break for that commercial, the rains came, and for a moment you couldn't even see across the field as we got one of those sudden South Florida thunder showers that came whipping across the Orange Bowl off the Atlantic Ocean. And now the rain has let up quite a bit, and we're ready for more play. The Canes have the ball. First and ten at the 47. Kelly drops the throw and throws long, going for the bomb for Brodsky, and it is incomplete. A flag on the play, and defending was Paul Lankford, number 12, for Penn State. Well, I wonder if they might not call this on Brodsky for offensive interference down there because Brodsky was out of position. Lankford played him very well, had good, good position, and, and attempted the interception, and I think they're going to call Brodsky. You're absolutely correct. Let's look at it again. Brodsky on a straight fly pattern. He just turns it on. He's got Langford to beat. Langford plays him very well. Good position. Now Langford sees the ball coming and gets better position. And Brodsky sees it right here and knows the interception is coming. Now I don't know if there's any interference there or not. That's a close, close call. They both seem to be going for the ball, but Brodsky couldn't get out of his way. Pass interference against Miami. Takes a loss of down. Second down. Second down, first and ten, the ball on the 47, or rather on the 37 of Miami right now. Well, let's look at it again and see if Brodsky interferes. Right. 
I don't know. Kelly dropping to throw again, looking, being rushed, and unloads it high. He was going for Brodsky over here, but unloads it a little bit high. Brodsky was pretty well covered, and so that would bring up third down, 25 ball on the 38. A couple of good calls, I think, by the Miami Hurricanes. They've gone for the pass now two times in a row following a very heavy rain shower. And you'd have to think that Penn State would think they'd keep the ball on the ground because it's a little bit slippery and maybe Kelly couldn't throw it. But he has not shown any trepidation at all about throwing the ball despite the fact it is very wet out there right now. Brodsky splits left and Belk splits right. Eye formation. Chris Hobbs, 33. The up back, the pitch goes. Mark Rush to the tailback off the top of the eye. Flags on the play. And I think we had number 69, Leo Wisniewski, jumping off sides again. Three times in a row in the first half. And that was when Rick came in at quarterback and changed the cadence. Now they've got Kelly in there. And uh, this kid is anxious. Wants to get back in there and mix it up. He is aggressive. Third and 20. Ball on the 43-yard line for Miami, and they're at their own 43. Just taking a look at the penalties, Penn State's been penalized six times for 30 yards, and that uh, offensive interference penalty on Brodsky was only their second penalty. They've only had two penalties that have cost them 23 yards, so the Canes are playing a little bit better discipline football than Penn State in the penalty department. At the 43, Jim Kelly at the controls for Miami. Kelly hit behind the line of scrimmage. Walker Lee Ashley, a junior from Jersey City, New Jersey, comes in from the defensive end position and makes the hit on Jim Kelly behind the line. A big play by Ashley. He only got so much time back there. <laughs> Walker Lee Ashley is not to be deterred. He went over two blockers on that one. Wow. That's what you call third effort. Fourth and 29, the ball remaining on the 34-yard line. Greg LaBelle to punt. He's at the 20-yard line. Gets off a high spiral. Ball takes it at the 28-yard line, stacked up at the 29. Jay Brophy, sophomore from Akron, Ohio, down to make the tackle for Miami. Well, that's one of the strong trademarks of a Howard Schnellenberger coach football team. Very, very good work by the specialty teams. And there you saw excellent work by Jay Brophy out of Akron, Ohio. 9.55 to play in the third quarter. Miami up 14 to nothing on Penn State. Receivers left and right for the Nittany Lions. Todd Blackledge remaining at quarterback. High formation and Blackledge dropping the throw. Blackledge throws, and he's got Garrity along the sidelines for the first down in Miami territory at the 48. Greg Garrity, a junior from Bradford Woods, Pennsylvania. Let's take another look at it. Play action fake. He goes back to throw. He's going right here for Garrity, and Garrity, nice, nicely thrown pass. Lippert is coming over there quickly, but uh, nice pattern by Garrity and a well-thrown pass. Runs his little out pattern, and there he is. Very hard to defense against. Lippett comes over, and Lippett was the last man. If he uh, had not been there, that could have gone all the way. First and 10 at the 48-yard line of Miami for Penn State. The give-off goes to Williams. The tailback stacked up at the 46-47 yard line. Got some tough inside yardage there against the middle of Miami's defensive unit. Ball moving to the 46. Second and eight coming back for the Nittany Lions of Penn State. Homecoming weekend in Miami. Last night, here in the Orange Bowl, the Commodores and the Beach Boys. Todd Blackledge drops the throw. Unloads a quick one. He's got Williams coming out of the backfield. Williams has got the first down inside the 35 and fights down inside the 30 to the 28-yard line. And Blackledge is down on the play. Tremendous pressure. Tremendous pressure coming by the Hurricanes right there. Get another look at it. I'll see who it was. I believe it was uh, Tim Flanagan coming very, very hard, putting the pressure on. And here, here we'll see it again. Right here is Flanagan as he buries into Blackledge. 
And that was a good play. That's the same screen pass that the University of Miami has used to burn Penn State with a couple of times. And they ran it very, very well. They set it up well. But Flanagan, coming with a lot of momentum, really hits Blackledge hard. And they are going to take him out of the game for a while. So his backup will come in as Blackledge goes out. I'm, I'm sure we're going to see Blackledge again pretty soon. But his backup is Frank Rocco, number 18, 6 two and a half, 208 pounds, a junior from Altoona, Pennsylvania. First and 10, ball on the 28-yard line. And here is Rocco, first play of the game. Receivers left and right and an eye formation. The pitch goes to Williams, and Miami diagnosed that fake reverse as Lester Williams and Rodney Bellinger, number four, got right in there to make the hit for the Canes at the 30, a two-yard loss for Penn State. Eight eighteen to play third quarter. Miami sitting on a fourteen to nothing lead, and Penn State with possession of the football, driving at the Miami forty yard line. And again, we've got Todd Blackledge right in the ball game, right back in after being shook up on one play, was out for one play, and now he's right back. Receivers left and right, and still the eye, and dropping the throw is Blackledge. But there are whistles and flags all over the field. We'll wait for the call. We've got 7.59 remaining, third quarter, and the University of Miami surprisingly up by a score of 14-0 over the number one ranked Penn State Nittany Lions. Paternal unhappy with that call. Too much time before the Lions from the Nittany Valley, and that will move the football back to the 35-yard line. Second and 17. So far, as you can see, not too many penalties in the ball game for not that much yard. It's been a been a clean ball game. Blackledge dropping the throw on second and 17, looking, and he dumps one out to Garrity incomplete. David Jefferson with good coverage for the University of Miami, number 37. Big David, the 6'2", 220-pound senior from Miami. Well, I kind of wonder. They were going to Mike McCloskey, their tight end, a lot on that uh, little sprint pattern and throwing to him on the underneath, and they were picking up a lot of yardage on it. And then they've, uh, this half, they've come out and they've decided to go with a split end Garrity. They threw uh, to Garrity a couple of times in the first half, but uh, I'm surprised they haven't gone to McCloskey. He was a big gainer for them, caught four passes in the first half, and they've kind of laid off. We'll have to see if they come back to him now. Third and 17, ball on the 35 yard line, wing to the left side. And a lone setback for Penn State. Blackledge to throw. He throws long, and it is intercepted by Miami. Freddy Marion picks it off. He's up to 25. He's out of bounds along the near sideline at the 30-yard line. Well, that is, as I said earlier, if there is one complaint about Blackledge, it's that sometimes he'll get in a bit of a hurry, make a bad judgment call, and throw into a crowd. Now watch this. When I say throw into a crowd, look at this. Nothing but red jerseys all around. And he was going for McCloskey, as I, as I just said. I thought they'd try to go to him. McCloskey on a post pattern. And uh, there, there was the crowd of red, red shirted jerseys and Freddie Marion, the all time uh, great leading interceptor for the University of Miami, with another great catch. Howard Schnellenberger says if there is a better defensive secondary man uh, in the United States of America, he's in the NFL. Well, look at you high stepping it down that side. Nice interception. Well, thank you so much. And, and good moves afterwards. I tried to shake him a little bit, you know, a little shake it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coach, you called it right. The, the commentator said that if there was a better safety playing in college, or if there was a better safety, they're playing in the NFL. So and I stand by that statement. <laughs> <laughs> you saw something in this yeah, young well, man, huh? Obviously, yeah, I did. He went up there and distinguished himself for a few years. Yes, he did. And, and well, tell us about, you know, your NFL career, and then what are you doing now? Well, actually, I played 10 years for the New England Patriots. I what did I say? A know. few? Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a few. Just a few. <laughs> and I'm one of the Decade. managers at David Moss Toyota up in uh, Sanford, Florida. Great car dealership up there. Wonderful car. Yeah. David is a great individual. And does now, a lot in the community. And and back to your career at New England, though, Super Bowl in 80 85, yes, okay. against the Chicago Bears. We won't talk about that no, game. No, we, we won't. won't. We won't relive that game. <laughs> oh, that was nightmare. <laughs> that was nightmare. You, but, you, yeah, I had a long career up there with them. And, um, I'm, I'm so um, excited about the turn that they've taken. You know, uh, Mr. Kraft has come in and taken the franchise to a new level. And you played with some college teammates 
at New England as well, right? Yes, I did. Uh, actually, that year I was drafted. I was drafted in the fifth round. Lester Williams was uh, 1B. Uh, Kenneth Sim was taken before him, and also Ronnie Lippitt uh, played up there as well. And I also had opportunity. Danny Miller came up there and kicked for us for a short while as well. So some Florida boys up in the northeast in the snow. That must Forever have been a lot so. of fun. A lot of fun. Well, and, and Don, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on. And I know you did play in the NFL, so tell everybody a little bit about your yeah, I got drafted in the NFL right out of college, obviously, and spent a year in Tampa. Bay and a couple years with the Indianapolis Colts and came back to South Florida and got involved in uh, TV and radio with WQAM right now and get a chance to work with you every Saturday after those University of Miami games. And of course, uh, Steve, you know I'm in the flooring business, so that, that's something that you said that I could talk about today. We've got uh, Don Bailey Flooring, has got five locations in South Florida, and we, we do all types of flooring, Steve. Yeah. Do, do you need any props, like well, phone numbers? Well, one eight, you know, we've got foot. a 1-800 number, 69-cent <laughs> laminate. We come up here and help coach with his floors. We do all you, kinds of You guys want to know my professional experience? I was drafted 50, uh, 42nd by the Washington Redskins. I was offered $6,000, and I turned that down and went to the uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats for $9,000. That's my job. <laughs> Coach, you sounds like you played like, well, kind of like I did, I guess. <laughs> well, Don, how, how many years did you end up in the NFL? I had three years. And, and the, your coach at Tampa was McKay? Actually, John McKay. And, yeah. and uh, we had Frank Cush at Indianapolis and Rod Dauhauer. And in all, all sincerity, Steve, the program that we had at Miami was run better than some of the National Football League right. teams that I well, experienced. Now, you weren't responsible for McKay's famous line that, you know, when somebody asked him about the execution of his team and he said he's for it. Now, you weren't responsible <laughs> for that. No, 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 no. He actually had that uh, season where he didn't win a football game before I got there. No, oh, okay. Got, you made yeah. all the difference. Yeah, all the difference. <laughs> Two wins that season. Well, let's get back to the game. And when we come back, we'll have the rest of the third. First and ten at the 29-yard line. Split backfield behind Jim Kelly. Kelly's give goes to Hobbs. Hobbs bobbles the football and falls on it behind the line at the 24-yard line. So he loses five yards on that. It'll be second down and 15 coming back for the Hurricanes of Miami. Good pressure there put on by number 37, Walker Lee Ashley. He certainly has played very, very well for the blue and white Nittany Lions. Rocky Belk, 20, splits to the left side. Rodsky, 43, to the right. Kelly, number 12, operates at quarterback, a split backfield behind him. Kelly to throw. He's got Rodsky for the first down at the 40, and Brodsky goes forward to the 45-yard line. Larry Brodsky, tackled by Mark Robinson, number 32. Let's take another look at it. Kelly with lots of time. And again, he threads the needle. There's Brodsky, and he makes a good catch. And boy, look at the effort this guy gives. He'll, he'll get every inch he can get. Brodsky on a little short post pattern. He turns in, beats his man. They put him one-on-one -on, -one on the linebacker, and he's got it. First down. At the 45-yard line, goes to Chris Hobbs. Hobbs turns the corner here on the near side, up to the midfield stripe, bobbles the football. There's a fight for it, and it's recovered by Penn State. And making the recovery, Mark Robinson, number 32, as what? Robinson makes a good play. What a game he has played. He has been in, I don't know how many tackles he's got this afternoon, but he has been a standout defensively for Penn State. Here's another look at it. Here comes Hobbs, right there. He, he was loses, stripped but he the never ball. really put it away. He never had it put away well. And a lot of white jerseys all around there, and they've got it. Blackledge operating at quarterback. First and 10 on the 40-yard line. Blackledge drops the throw, looks and throws, and he's got a man wide open, Williams, and he is out of bounds. Out of bounds. Williams out of bounds. A little upset about that call. Here's a guy who is a, a guy that can do many, many things. Runs back, kicks, plays tailback, and as you can see, uh, catches the ball very well. Went up high there, and let's see. Yep, he was out of bounds. There's no getting around it. Ronnie Lippett, the quick corner man or right corner man for Miami, was the coverage guy. Let's give credit to the officials. They haven't missed any this afternoon that we have seen. They have been right on it on, and on some very close calls and just done an excellent job. Second and 10, ball remains at the 40. Blackledge gives off as give off goes to Meade, the fullback right up the middle on the draw to the 38 yard line. Tony Ciccolo, the nose tackle, makes the hit. Penn State has scored in their last 102 games. So far, Miami has held them scoreless, but we're in the middle of the third quarter.
third and eight with the ball on the 38 yard line for Penn State. Sophomore quarterback from North Canton, Ohio. Todd Blackledge with an eye formation. Drops again to throw. Dumps a quick one out to Williams at the 35, and Williams is brought down at the 32 yard line, short of the first down. That's a good play, though. They send Williams right up the middle on play action, like he's going to take the ball running, and then he just turns and stops about seven, eight yards upfield, and Blackledge delivered to him. Credit Greg Brown, the linebacker, number 93, a junior from Woodbridge, Virginia, with the tackle. And here again, the rain is beginning to fall in Miami. <laughs> It's really coming down again and everybody's scurrying for cover. You can see it. One of those sudden showers we get here in South Florida so often. Hurricane fans could care less with a 14 to nothing lead. And now here come the Lions up with uh, heavy rainfall and they're going to go. Fourth and three and they're going to go for it. And dropping back to throw is Blackledge. Pump fakes and throws. And he's got his man, McCloskey, at the 22-yard line. And there's a flag on the play as McCloskey goes down at the 21. Could have been for a late hit. We'll see in a moment. Here's Blackledge. Looking. Pump fakes. And then throws. McCloskey is wide open here at the 26. Steps across the 25. And that's what they're going to call. To make the call for the flag was for the late hit by Greg Brown, number 93. Hurricanes did not need that at this point of the ball game. Not with uh, Penn State driving. To get a call like that would be a half the distance uh, call. Put it down on about the 10 yard line, I would guess. And that's where they're going to spot it. So it's a first down for the Nittany Lions of Penn State. Just outside the 10 yard line. Miami up 14 0, and here again, Penn State knocking on the door. I formation. The pitch goes to Williams. Williams turns the corner and is brought down as he hits the corner. Freddie Marion, the free safety number 31, was right there to make the stop for the Miami Hurricanes along with Scotty Nicholas. Great pursuit by the Hurricanes on that play. And I say great pursuit because I think that Penn State probably has better team speed, Jim. But they have not been able to turn the corners very well this afternoon. Second and 10, ball remaining just outside the 10. The Nittany Lions with wide side to the right, split backfield, and Blackledge is going to throw. And he's got his man, but it's at the six yard line, and that was Cab, who is the tight end. 6'5, 247, a senior from Wayne, New Jersey. Joe Paterno along the sideline on the far side. David Jefferson, the rover back, made the hit on that one and advanced the ball to the six. Well, I'm surprised they put the ball in the air at that point. Uh, it's raining very hard here right now. I don't expect this to last too long, but it is very, very wet out there. The ball is very slippery. They live and die by the run, and yet they go to the air when they need crucial yardage down close. Third and goal at the six-yard line for Penn State's Nittany Lions. A lone setback and a wing to the right side. Receivers left and right, and Blackledge looks to throw. He's looking for somebody open. Throws high, and it is incomplete. Up there high to break it up was Fred Marion. Number 31, the free safety intended for Vito Cab, the tight end. Well, they had all kinds of people back there. David Jefferson was back there. Freddie Marion was back there. And again, he threw into the crowd. There were a lot of red jerseys around. Now there's Jefferson right there, 37, staying right with number 85. Now here comes Marion in on the play. Marion times his leap so well and just goes right up there and taps it away. And Ronnie Lippert was coming in there too. Now they go for the field goal on fourth and goal from the six. Brian Franco and the kick will come from the 14. It's a 24 yard attempt. It's going to be difficult for him because of the slippery turf and uh, the wind blowing against him at this point in time as the rain comes in off the Atlantic Ocean here in the Orange Bowl. And now there's a timeout called. And I don't know if it's an official timeout or call by one of the teams. We'll see in just a moment. Joe Paterno on the far side trying to uh, see. It was uh, an official, looked like it was an official timeout. The center for uh, Penn State asked to have the ball dried off. The ball was slippery and he didn't want to take a, take a chance of snapping it and getting it by the uh, holder back there, Terry uh, Rakowski. 
Here comes the kick. It's up in the air, and it is no good off to the left side. Ah, off to the left side. So, again, Penn State goes to the well and comes up dry. Well, Miami dodges another bullet. Good break up there in the end zone, and Thank it's 14-0, you. so you guys are in, in control. But, Coach, i got to go back. Before we saw the Hobbs fumble there, um, you're on the sideline, and you're looking up to the student section in the band and you're waving your arm you're trying to get them quiet you had to train everybody down there even the band to shut up when you're on offense. well they sure as hell didn't know the difference between offense and defense <laughs> they jammed our signal all the time you know beverly was put in charge of that i put her in charge of the, the cheerleaders and the band and everybody and uh, she finally got them trained pretty good by the time we got in that fifth year but it was really tough there for a while they actually they'd get we had to get uh, what was it called a yummy yummy jimmy uh, it, jimmy we, from fort myers yeah. yum, yum. <laughs> we, he had been he had been the uh, best cheerleader they had ever had, and we brought him back as an alumni cheerleader. Really made the cheerleaders there mad, but he would really get it going. He was uh, he was a he, he he made the difference. Well, and and you know, being homecoming, there was a lot of fans there, and it wasn't sold out for a number one game. But that's kind of the Miami fans, I guess. It was raining and on you, and off. You know, Steve, I got to defend those fans for a minute. Now they went 16 <laughs> years without a bowl game before we went to the Peach Bowl. They were going to cheer about anything, whether we were on offense or defense or special teams. But as Coach said, he had to get uh, he had to teach the fans how to win, teach the team how to win. And and Coach, really, one of the best things you did was bring back the Yama Yama Man. <laughs> <laughs> After recruiting you, anything would have been. That's right. Well, <laughs> well you're, you're, of course, you're now you're at Florida Atlantic University, coming off a, a big first bowl game and a win against Memphis in the New Orleans Bowl. And tell us a little bit about maybe the similarities between Miami and building that championship program to building the program here. Well, it's a whole lot harder to uh, turn a program around than it is to start one from scratch after you get through taking care of the raising the money and building the buildings and things like that because everything is fresh and new here you know down in Miami we had to go, we had to we had to turn some things around we had to change some change some thinking uh, here uh, the student body has gotten behind us uh, so much quicker uh, the band we didn't have a band now we've got a little band and uh, and they're cheering all the time we've got a group called the prowlers owlers prowlers um, and they really got the student body going and and we've been able to recruit just the same way we did down in Miami we've been able to recruit right here in South Florida we're now moving up to uh, Jacksonville we're moving up to the Panhandle but we're bringing in all Florida kids and when you bring in kids in that have a common uh, history or a common uh, geographic location and they, they you sell them on the idea that if we all stay together there's no team that we can't beat in time and uh, it's going along really well. We've got an opportunity right now after coming off those three big wins last year, one against FIU, one against Troy, and one against uh, Memphis. I keep getting the Memphis University of Memphis State. Uh, but now uh, with a quarter, great quarterback like we had there with Jim in his uh, second year, third year, uh, here now with Rusty in his second year, we've got an opportunity to uh, to make this move into the next to the next level. The stadium's coming on line here in two years. Um, after that, I think there's a great opportunity that we might be invited to a BCS Bowl, a BCS conference, and uh, you know what conference I'm thinking about. And uh, if that all comes to pass, like I, I have full confidence it will, uh, within the next five years we'll be uh, playing against the very best. And you know, next year we go down to play University of Texas in Austin. And after watching them in their their bowl game, and after watching my team in my bowl game, uh, I think we're going to have a heck of a heck of a knockdown drag out. Well, we see the great pictures of the stadium, and, and uh, that is going to come in time. That's been decided, and and uh, I've been very close watching the program grow. And and you mentioned Rusty Smith, great young quarterback, and the fans out there will hear more about him because he's certainly a talented quarterback, and and hopefully he'll progress and maybe be that first guy that gets to that next level. Well, there's no question, no doubt in my mind. If he doesn't get interested, injured, he's going to be a number one draft choice. Well, this is great stuff. And when we come back, we'll have the fourth quarter of this Gridiron Great. Second and four for the Nittany Lions with the football resting on the eight-yard line as we begin the fourth quarter. Miami sitting on that 14 to nothing lead, so Joe Paterno's troops have their work cut out for him here in the final period. Plus the fact Kurt Warner, third leading rusher in the United States, out as he re-injured that hamstring, went out in the second quarter. 
Todd Blackledge, a sophomore quarterback, North Canton, Ohio, operating. And the giveoff goes to John Williams, the tailback. He's straight up the middle. He's going to be close to a first down. We'll see when they unpile. About a yard short, I guess. So it'll be third and short yardage coming back. Penn State has stuck to the game plan. Take a look at yards passing, 202 yards passing. Blackledge 17 of 28, so they've gone to the air more this afternoon, but the total yards are very even, despite the score. But it's those points on the board that count when you take a look at it. Miami's been able to capitalize uh, on the scoring opportunities with the foot of Danny Miller. And also, they were able to come up with a great pass connection of Kelly Dabrowski, which put their touchdown on the board. The carry forward for Penn State got the first down. As the fullback went up the middle, Scott Nicholas made the tackle on Meade. Meade gets the first down, so it'll be first and 10. Ball on the 13-yard line for Penn State. They're deep in their own territory. Receivers left and right for Penn State. Eye formation. Now they go to the split backfield. Blackledge drops the throw. He dumps a quick one out to Williams. And Williams is hit at the 14-yard line. Fumble on the play. And it looks like Tony Ciccolo was the guy that caused that. And recovered the fumble. Tony Ciccolo, the nose tackle for Miami. And that's going to give the Canes possession of the football at the 15. Look, look at it again. Now watch here come Bob Nelson. Number, you know, this, this is Scotty Nicholas. I, fifth, Scotty Nicholas, number 66, causes the fumble. And there's Chicolo to fall on him. So great play by Scotty Nicholas, number 66. Tony Chicolo recovers the fumble, and he also was right there. His dad, Nick Ciccolo, was an All-American guard at Miami in the early 50s. A split backfield now behind Jim Kelly. The give-off goes to Mark Rush, and Rush fights for yardage up to the 10-yard line. Five-yard carry for Mark Rush. I'll watch it again. Here comes Scotty Nicholas, and he causes the ball to come loose right there as... Uh, Looks Somebody like he attempted to block him out there. Looked like he slapped the foot of the running back Williams that yep. uh, kind of put him off balance a little bit and he lost the ball. Still a little slippery on the turf too. Second and six ball on the 10 yard line. Split backfield again behind Jim Kelly. The give off again goes to Rush and Rush goes forward to the six yard line. Well this turnover could be absolutely critical to Penn State because with the Hurricanes leading 14 to nothing, even if they can't punch it in the end zone, they can go to Danny Miller. And there's one of the Nittany Lions being hung up to roast. At any rate, if they even get a field goal out of this, this turnover, they're going to be up 17 to nothing. And that means Penn State will have to score two touchdowns and a field goal to go ahead. And they're going to have to go for a couple of two-point conversions if they can get the two touchdowns. So this is pivotal. The give-off goes to Robert Speedy Neal, stacked up right at the line on uh, third down for the Canes on third and two. And it looked like it was Roger that made the hit. Now the question, fourth and short yardage, do you go for it or do you kick the field goal? Snellenberger's going to kick the field goal. Well, he's got no other choice. Even though the field is very, very slippery, uh, he has to go with Miller because three points is going to Force him to score three times, so this is the right decision all the way by Schnellenberger. And Paterno must be beside himself with that turnover down there deep in their own territory at this point of the game. That's the mistake they could not afford. Miller is deadly accurate. LaBelle, number five, will hold, and Danny Miller from Clewiston, Florida, will go for the field goal. His foot is into it, and it's good. Now Miami sitting on a 17 to nothing lead on Penn State. Penn State would take the Miami kickoff and drive to midfield, where it's third and ten. Third and ten, ball on the midfield stripe. Wing, and the wing would be to the right side. And again, Blackledge drops the throw. Looks, throws, and he's got Garrity at the 30-yard line, and a good catch by Garrity. Puts the ball inside the 30 at the 25. Fred Marion makes the hit for Miami. Blackledge has a lot of courage. He came right back. 
through basically the same pattern except to a different receiver as Garrity had replaced Baugh and they're again running the same type of a post pattern and hit him right at the uh, 30 and move the ball inside of the 29 yard line. So that gives Penn State a first down inside the 30 at the 29 yard line and the Nittany Lions down 17 points. Miami leading Penn State 17 to nothing. Blackledge number 14, sophomore from North Canton, Ohio. Eye formation for the Nittany Lions of Penn State. Blackledge to throw, he's got time and he's got his man inside the 15 yard line, Greg Garrity makes the catch number 19 for Penn State. Ronnie Lippett, 17 for Miami, makes the hit, the corner man. So the Lions are knocking on Miami's door right now and they've got to put points on the board. They're down 17-0. A lot at stake in this game. Penn State ranked number one in the nation. Receivers left and right. Ball 11 to the left to the bottom of your screen. Jackson 82 to the top of the screen. Blackledge dropping to throw and dumps one off and he's got his man right at the line but there was a flag on the play but the official signals touchdown. Mike McCloskey 81 was the receiver for Penn State. And we'll see what that penalty flag is in just a moment although they did maybe uh, two officials held up their hands for the touchdown. Pass interference against Miami. Of course, it's going to be declined, and Penn State gets the touchdown. So they're on the board with six points. Now the question is, do they go for one or go for two at this point in time? Got to go for two. That's what they're going to do. A lot of rain falling here in Miami. It's been intermittent throughout the evening as the showers have come off the ocean. Receivers left and right in a split backfield behind Todd Blackledge, the quarterback. As the Nittany Lions go for two. Blackledge looks to throw, throws, and it is incomplete. Intended for Baugh, number 11, Kevin Baugh, coming off the left side to split in, running a quick look in, and falls is incomplete. This is a big play, too. Now, Blackledge goes back. He's got plenty of time to throw the ball, and he delivers a bullet. And uh, it's just, well, this is the touchdown. Here's the interference call again. We look at that again. Blackledge is cool. He waits the last second before he delivers the ball, and McCloskey running a perfect post takes the football at 17 to 6. Brian Franco kicks off for Penn State. It is high and deep and is going to go out of the end zone. The deep man 44 was Keith Griffin, just watched it roll up near the stands, and it will come out to the 20 yard line. It'll be first and 10 for the Hurricanes. Here is where the Penn State defense is really going to be tested, and Paternal knows it too, as he's talking along the sidelines to his coaching staff. They've got to shut down the University of Miami Hurricanes now very quickly in uh, three plays, force them to kick the ball away, get it back, and go for another score. So the Penn State defense is going to be severely tested right now. Miami, of course, wants to play possession football. Jim Kelly hands off to Lorenzo Smokey Roan. Turns the corner of field to the 25 and out of bounds at the 27 yard line. So Smokey Roan picks up seven yards in that carry as he is able to turn the corner on Penn State. Mark Robinson, 32, makes the hit for the Lions. Second and three at the 27 yard line for the Hurricanes. This is where Howard Stellenberger, former offensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins, wants to play that possession type football. The give goes to Speedy Neal, the big fullback, and he fights forward to the 28 yard line, but tough, tough yardage inside against that big Penn State line. Again, Robinson 32 makes the tackle. Well, he's played a game. Mark Robinson. Less than eight minutes to play. There you can see the clock tick away. Joe Paterno pacing the sidelines. Miami with the eye. Speedy Neal, sophomore fullback, Key West, number 38. Smokey Roan, number 46, a senior from Miami, running back spot. They go to the split backfield again. Roan gets the call and is hit. As he turns the corner, ball pops into the air, and it's picked off by Penn State. And number 12, Paul Lankford, was the man that picked it off. That's going to give the Lions another shot down close. 
Another big play by Paul Langford, who had a big interception in the first half. They came way empty as a result of that interception. But here, a big turnover by Roan as the ball just pops out. It's slippery, and right here, he gets hit in a helmet, knocks the ball high in the air. Here comes Langford over, and he holds on to it. Great play by Langford. And now, you can now watch here that. Watch his helmet come in. That helmet is speared right out of there. And Langford comes up with it. High formation for Penn State. First and 10 ball on the 26 yard line. Blackledge gives off to Meade, and Meade is hit and brought down by Miami's interior tackle. Lester Williams, number 73. Linebacker, number 93. Greg Brown helping out. Howard Snellenberger exhorting his, his defense to hold. Well, we've been talking about Penn State being number one. They aren't number one by any kind of fluke. They are one of the superior teams in the United States, have been for years and years, and they caused that turnover right there. They're going to be right back in this ballgame if they score. Second and 10, and dropping back to throw is Blackledge, and he throws, and he's got Williams at the 30, the 25. He's inside the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's going to go. He's going to score. John Williams races into the end zone. He is a backup to Kurt Warner, 5'9 and a half, 193, a sophomore from Somerville, New Jersey. Raced into the end zone and put another touchdown on the board for Penn State. So now we got a brand new ball game in the old Orange Bowl. Well, now you have Penn State with just about seven minutes remaining in the football game. Let's look at it again. Here's Blackledge to Williams. Beautiful screen play. The Hurricanes completely out of position on this. Nobody to come over to give any support. Lippitz there. He gets blocked out of the play. And Williams sees the end zone and knows he's got it. Now they they've got to go for two. They're so going to they, do it right sure. here. But now a touchdown can win it for him if they score here and get another touchdown they can win a field goal will tie if they get this two point conversion. Blackledge to throw looks and he's got his man in the end zone for the score. Number 82 and that is the flanker Kenny Jackson. Makes the catch right there to make it 17 to 14 Miami sitting on a three point lead over Penn State. Well, we got a ball game, 17-14. Things get a little nervous on on the sideline. Coach, I got to ask you, when it when you you're in control of a ball game like this, and now all of a sudden a turnover, they get a quick touchdown. Now it's 17-14. You know, you maybe see the momentum. How do you handle that as a head coach? Well, the first thing you got to do is make sure you don't show any emotion that you uh, are concerned and that the, we're we're in, we're running into a bad situation. Obviously, we're still ahead. Obviously, the game is getting short. We're going to have the opportunity to get the ball back, and then our offense has to put it on, has put the, has to put the drive together to uh, seal the game. Uh, my assistant coaches obviously are doing their thing on both both sides of the field, uh, discussing what went wrong, uh, what we're going to do to uh, get this back straightened out, and the offense down there are talking about what plays we're going to run to uh, win this football game on the offensive side of the ball. Does it show an emotion? You don't want to show it to the players, but do you get a little bit more emphatic with your coaches stepping over and saying, no, hey, let's I, go, we got to get this, I, I this, do this. That, uh, I do that more when we're, everything's going well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, the, right. no, you, you've, you've got to make dang gone sure that you don't have a real difference in your emotion when your things are going bad and when they're going good, uh, particularly when you know you've got a solid football team and your guys have been schooled for this very situation. We tell our players and they go through so much physical conditioning that when I tell them that they'll never be out conditioned in the fourth quarter, never will you be more tired than your opponent. The fourth quarter is ours and if we've done that enough in other games then it's our in our base in our mentality then we can go out and get that done. Well, you make a great point. I wish more coaches in today's game showed less emotion on the sideline, kept that even keel, because I think it does, you know, settle your team down. And, and Fred, now all of a sudden you got a ball game here. Are yes. you getting a little nervous on the sideline about your defensive effort? Not really. I mean, we play good defense all day. And uh, one of the things is when you know you're playing to a certain yard line. You know, and as a safety, personally, I'm always aware of the field position. You can't take as many chances of jumping routes. And, uh, you know, you stay deep as the deepest. And if it goes down, you let the field goal kicker try to win it. But you don't help him by jumping something and then a guy catching an easy deep Jumped ball. Easy. But we knew where we had to play to the extra stop. And Franco had been kicking terribly that day. I mean, he had, <laughs> I mean, he was like 0 for yeah, 4 or this, something like this that. This is uh, 3 or 4. And, Don, in the huddle, you're going out there, you know you got to move the ball. 
anything interesting come back as far as thinking about that game? Well, you know, Steve, when, when you think about being a Howard Schnellenberger team, you never go into a ball game thinking you're going to lose, whether it was in 1979, whether it was that day in the Orange Bowl, or whether it's 2008 at, at, at FAU. You don't think you're going to lose, but the, the highest compliment I can think I can play uh, Jim Kelly was when you were in a huddle with Jim Kelly, you always knew you had a chance to win a football game. And it didn't matter what the score was. We knew we had a great defense. We knew we were prepared. We knew we were at home. But Jim Kelly was the quarterback, so anything was possible. Yeah, well, when we come back, it's going to be this exciting finish of this gridiron great Miami versus Penn State. Miami was forced to punt on its next possession. It's Penn State's ball at their own 26. What you have, the scenario is this. Three minutes, seven seconds remaining in the football game. The Nittany Lions down by three points. A touchdown will win it. A field goal will tie it. And they're going to take over on their own 26-yard line. Receivers left and right. Split backfield behind Todd Blackledge. First and ten. Ball at the 26-yard line for Penn State. They're in their own territory. The give-off goes to Meade. The fullback rips up the middle. A good gain as he gets to the 37-yard line. First down. Brought down by Fred Marion for Miami. Watch Freddie Marion as he makes the tackle on Mike Meade, number 38, charging up. Marion tries to rip the ball. Now watch this tackle. He tackles the football. Less than three minutes to play. First and ten for Penn State. Looking to throw as Blackledge. He throws long for Williams, and he's got him inside the 30 at the 35-yard line. Has this football game turned around, or has it turned around? It has turned around. Penn State has the momentum. Miami's got their back to the door. They've got to stiffen out defensively. Kurt Warner out of the game. Williams playing super football right now. Just a great, great play. Great pass, a super catch. One of those almost impossible to defend against. First and 10 at the 25-yard line for Penn State. Receivers left and right, eye formation. Waiting for the snap is Todd Blackledge. He pitches, fumble on the play by Williams. Miami is recovered. Tony Chickalo, the nose tackle, number 71. He's not going to let go of that football. That's the game ball with 2.29 to play. Tony Chickalo, 6'3", 244, a junior from Miami. Well, the ball is wet. It is slippery. And you may be premature saying that's the game ball. If they win, it may be. But there are still two minutes and 29 seconds left, and the Hurricanes have got to get, got to hold on to it for two minutes and 29 seconds. I'll tell you. Now, there they, they missed up on the exchange right there. It's, it, the ball is wet, and there's Chickalo. So I don't believe it. What a football game. <laughs> Split backfield behind Kelly. Two tight ends. The give off goes to Mark Rush. And Rush across the 30-yard line to the 31. Three yards on that carry. Second and seven coming back for the Hurricanes. Two great coaches of two great football teams. The University of Miami rebuilding. Trying to become a national power. Penn State, of course, has been a traditional national power for the past 10, 15 years. Second and seven at the 31 yard line. Jim Kelly at the line. Somebody jumped. And we'll see who it is. The flags were dropped and it may be going against Miami. Waiting for the call from the field. Well, it's hard to tell up here, but apparently everybody started to come from the Penn State defensive side, and I would guess maybe somebody made a little move in on the offensive line that we couldn't detect from up here. Now Kelly is going up to see what it's all about. See what it's all about. I'm going to offset. Procedure here. Offsetting penalties. No play. So the ball remains at the 31-yard line. It'll be second and seven. Ball is on the near side hash mark. That would give Miami wide side of the left. Their play is in the game. Andy Barada, 84, comes out. Mark Cooper, 85, goes in. They've got two tight ends in. Cooper on the near side and Dennison on the far side. A split backfield behind Jim Kelly. Give off goes to Mark Rush, and he gets to the 39-yard line. Very tough yardage. That'll bring up third down for the Canes. 
Third and four, the ball on the 34. Penn State moving into the number one position, and they are behind by three points to Miami with a little over two minutes to play in the Orange Bowl. Waiting for the snap is Kelly. Split backfield behind him. Kelly goes straight up the middle. He's going to be close to the first down, but I don't think he got it. Another timeout used by Penn State. That's their last one, Jim. But if they can force the University of Miami to punt, uh, they get the ball back. They're going to call for the chains here. I think the Hurricanes want the chains to come in. They want to see how much they got to go for sure so they can make a decision here. Of course, you've got to kick it away, I would think, if they're short. No way they're going to hold on to it. And get a first down. <laughs> They're short by a yard. Yeah, they got it. Going to have to kick it away. Fourth and one, and that's what they're going to do. Greg LaBelle is in number five. No timeouts remaining for Penn State. LaBelle averaging 44 yards per kick this evening. Less than two minutes to play. 155 showing on the clock. Miami trying to cling to their three-point lead. Penn State desperately wants to get into at least field goal range. LaBelle standing at the 22, waiting for the snap, which will come from the 37. LaBelle boots it away high. Kevin Baugh, number 11, calls for a fair catch at the 32-yard line. So Penn State takes it over, and here comes the defense, and Miami's defense will definitely get the biggest test that they've had this season. So will the Penn State offense. Well below their 37 yards, 37 points per game average, having put 14 on the board. Here we go. Here comes Penn State out of the huddle. Todd Blackledge, who's played such a fine football game this evening, at the controls. Receivers left and right, split backfield behind them. Blackledge drops the throw. He's got the time, dumps a quick one out to Williams at the 36. Williams is hit twice and still gets away, fights, and gets a first down to the 44-yard line. Fred Marion, the free safety 31, brings him down. He is a great player, 146 yards last week in place of the injured Kurt Warner, and he's in again because Warner re-pulled the hamstring, and he has been the difference in this football game. He is a tremendous player. Penn State now with their hurry-up offense, eye formation, and Blackledge chants the signals. Blackledge drops the throw. He looks, throws, and it is intercepted by Miami. Intercepted by Miami's number 31, Fred Marion. Right there to make the interception. A minute 25 to play. Now, is that the team ball or That's is the, the game ball? <laughs> <laughs> or is the game ball the one Chicolo got? I think you're going to have to get the two tie. of them out if the Hurricanes can win this thing. Well, the Hurricanes defense comes through with a big play. They tip the ball, Blackledge's pass, tip, and Freddie Marion back there dives forward and picks it up. Well, there's the finisher, the clincher, Fred. Nice interception, down Thank on you. your knees, yes. and thanking the Lord, right? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we, we called him front page Fred after that. He made the front page of the Miami Herald, had, had the ball over his head, and he won the ball game. And the entire team, and the entire team took a major step forward and upward, and uh, I have to look at that as a game that uh, propelled us into the, uh, the orbit that uh, we eventually uh, uh, finished there in the game against Nebraska, but there was a lot of games after, between there. And for us to finish out the year undefeated with a win over the number one team in America, particularly being the Nittany Lions and Joe Paterno's team, certainly gave us a confidence as you could never find any other any other way in any other place. And even though it was a tough, hard-fought game, it wasn't a blowout. It was the kind of game we expected. And uh, it did uh, put us on a new a new track, an upward track.
And it was only the Nebraska game that would be better than that game. Right, yeah, that's what I was going to just ask you, because it's hard for coaches to kind of rank their victories because they all feel pretty good, but it, this was right up there with that Nebraska. Oh, it has to be right next to it, but the one that is closest is in between there is that first one where we didn't know what kind of team we had when we went up to uh, play Joe up 79. there in 79. We were three wins, four losses. We Kelly had never started a ball game. Uh, that was one that was a big one that got us to the bigger one that got us to the biggest one. Yeah, every step. And and Don, as a, as a player, you know, you just defeated the number one team. And, and it's funny because in 81, there were several teams that got, to, you know, knocked off as number one. But how are you feeling now about your, your chances to maybe win the national championship? Maybe not this year, but maybe the following year. But we knew, you know, you trusted Coach Schnellenberger. That really was the bottom line. And he had you believing that nothing was impossible. And to win that game, not only for the University of Miami and our fans, but that was a game that got the city of Miami me. All the Hurricane fans that suffered all those years when they went with uh, you know non-winning seasons, they got on the bus. Coach Schnellenberger kept driving it, and we know what happened. The rest is history. Well, and Fred, then they go on in '83 to win the championship against Nebraska. As a player that wasn't there to enjoy it with the team, but obviously a, a former player, how good are you feeling about that? I feel awesome. In fact, I was in my uh, living room uh, in Plainville, Massachusetts, watching the game, and just to see. Uh, where we had come from and you know once you with the you you're always a you it's that lifelong fraternity and you're always a part of whether they win or lose as coach said we're always a part of that there and I think that's what's so special about the relationship that we all share over the years whether you're a past player or present player it's just something that brings us back together and I know that Lou Saban uh, rejoiced with all of us because he's a guy that really brought Fred and a lot of good players on board. Uh, he was a guy that uh, uh, was a tough guy and made it easier for the, the, the players to accept me. And uh, I know that the fact that I didn't do anything on the defense but bring in a, a new system, but we didn't change anything from a terminology standpoint. Uh, we built on what Lou had done. And that was, I think, a real integral part of how good the defense played in those early years. And certainly he uh, has to be given a lot of credit for that as well. Well, and you, you deserve credit for realizing that. And, you know, most coaches come in and say, hey, it's my show. And, and uh, you know, you realized where the strengths and the weaknesses were, were and what needed to be changed. And, and I know a lot of the players, you know, when I got into the program, they were, they were afraid to death of you because <laughs> of, of the, the discipline that you instilled in them. But that discipline led to the championship and you know I, I think back to this game just final thoughts you, you know you think back to this game and this was the launching pad you know you think about the 79 game that kind of got Miami fans talking about Miami because they, they beat Penn State but then you un, you defeat a number one team and then you go on to win the championship a couple years later and, and really springboard this program into a 15-year run of being the dominant program in college football. Well, I think it's important that I point out that you're a product of this same uh, the same culture, and uh, I can see or listen to you talk, and it's obvious that you rejoice in the things that happened before you got there, and know that these guys built it to the point where you could then take it to the next level as well. Well, well I appreciate it and uh, certainly everything you've done for me and it was great sitting here watching this uh, gridiron great and you know some of these old old uh, teammates uh, Don and Fred thanks for coming and, thank and watching us again at uh, Boca Raton and Florida Atlantic's campus and thank you for joining us an outstanding game big upset Miami 17-14 over the number one ranked Penn State Nittany Lions.